All right. All right. So, a um, couple of questions already, and um, yes, a couple of questions already. This is great. I'll quickly take them up. So, uh, Hosam, like I said, uh, we are not uh, able to offer a certificate today of participation. This is an awareness session. Uh, CP points, yes, please get in touch with me and I will, uh, you know, um, get back to you on this, Amit, like I said. Um, audio line cutting for anybody, please let me know if you face any issues in terms of the audio. It's very important that you're able to hear me loud and clear. Uh, recording, yes, I am recording the session right now. And um, we will, uh, you know, make the recording available. If not holistically, at least parts of it, we will be making it available. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Let's jump straight into the slides. All right. Now, cybersecurity. What really is your understanding of cybersecurity? I always, always like to start these trainings with the question to the audience itself. What is your understanding of cybersecurity? So most of the time, the responses that I get, they fall upon the basis of uh, protection of information when it flows through a network, uh, protection of data pertaining to individuals, you know, uh, protection against cyber attacks, cyber criminals, and so on and so forth. So all of these answers are, are, are pretty right. Uh, I wouldn't say, uh, you know, wrong at all. In fact, let me try to break the whole concept down. Uh, at a high level by going through these questions and then we will try to you know answer the question by ourselves what is your understanding of the concept of cyber security we will come to this how is cyber security different from information security is physical security a part of cyber security and who is responsible for cyber security in an organization all right and then what is the first thing that you do when you detect a breach all right guys so when 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 I started out in this particular field of cybersecurity, this was back in 2008, 2009. Um, there was no concept of cybersecurity so much. It was more about information security. If you think about the, the flow of technology, the flow of data through, te through technology, you will realize how within the last 10 years or 11 years, um, the grip that technology has on, our, on us as individuals, it has only tightened. It has become deeper and it has become stronger. So for instance, um, 10 years back, organizations was still struggling to protect their information assets, which are flowing to public as well as private networks data assets pertaining to an individual pertaining to an organization as it flows through a network or as it exists in physical forms for example a printout but the world of cyber security it's more holistic than just protection of information all right if you come to think about it like i said the grip of technology on our lives it has evolved significantly within just the last 10 years so what happened in the last 10 years just to give you an example I remember when I was in university back in uh, 2008 and so on, I had to switch on my laptop and I had to open the browser and I had to type www.facebook.com if I needed to access my social media profile. Today, Facebook is probably running on the phones of everybody that is in this particular room in the background, and we don't really know what part of our conversations are being recorded by Facebook or any of the other apps for that matter running on our phones. This brings about a question, how much control do you and I have over our digital equivalents, over our digital profiles, over our digital personalities? This is a broader question. And this brings us to the field of privacy. All right, so we're talking about three things here, basically. Information security, cyber security, as well as privacy. Which one, how do these three worlds fit with each other? This is a question that we should try to answer on this particular slide. Information security, like I said, it's focused on the protection of information assets, which can pertain to an individual, it can pertain to an organization. It can exist physically, it can exist on a, uh, you know, as a soft copy, let's say, on a, on, a, on a hard disk or something like this. And we focus on protection of this particular information assets. Cyber security pertains to the protection of an individual itself. 
through the protection of information pertaining to that individual. Let me give you an example. You probably heard about cyber, about um, st stalking of individuals, cyber stalking. A number of criminal activities have emerged within the last five to ten years, which are focused on digital space, which are focused on social media platforms, for example. They don't have much to do in terms of protection of organizations from you know, cyber attacks, protection of information assets and so on. They are more focused on the protection of a human being. Right. How do you ensure that a person's life, a person's well-being is protected? On cyberspace. This is what cybersecurity is in fact evolving towards. It started 10 years ago as or maybe 15 or 20 years ago as the protection of information assets pertaining to organizations. This was the field of information security, but the emphasis, the subject, the field itself has evolved within the last 10 years or so to focus more on individuals and to focus excessively on their presence on cyberspace. All right, so this is one aspect of cybersecurity. The same aspect, the same the same uh, you know, focus of protection of information assets, it has become stronger. It is definitely not weakened as organizations have become more and more dependent on technology for the carrying out of their business processes. How do you ensure that these business processes are available at all points of time? The information assets that are supporting these business processes, they are protected at all points of time and the people, the employees, they are also protected at all points of time. So different aspects have become the focal areas of security itself within the last, I'd say, 10 to 15 years. And cybersecurity has evolved to the protection of human life itself, not just protection of information assets of organizations. It's evolved to the area of protection of human life. Why do you ask me? You must have heard about self-driven cars. You must have heard about digitally uh, you know, connected pacemakers. The latest forms of cyber attacks are focused on how can you compromise the life of an individual by hacking a self-driven car? In fact, these have not really been done in the real world yet, but there have been a lot of laboratory based simulations where you know a Tesla car can be hacked. So imagine you're driving your car and a, a connected car, let's say, and then uh, someone is able to hack into the brakes of your car. They don't work anymore when you're on the highway uh, going at 120 kilometers per hour. So that's all you need for, uh, you know, compromising the life of an individual. I mentioned briefly cyber stalking as well as cyber bullying, bullying and so on. These are criminal activities which are using cyberspace in order to affect the well-being of an individual, maybe even leading them to cause, uh, you know, take extreme or drastic measures like, for example, taking one's own life. All right. So all of these areas still constitute what cybersecurity is talking about. I briefly mentioned privacy as well. How is privacy different from cybersecurity? How is it different from information security? Like I said, we are trying to fit these three worlds together. So from what you've what we've seen so far, just to summarize, information security is a subset of cybersecurity. And from what I'm going to tell you right now, you will see that cybersecurity is a subset of the world of privacy. What do I mean by privacy? I briefly mentioned to you that we probably don't even know it, but Facebook or any of these apps running on our mobile phones are recording everything that we say, everything that we do, even without our knowledge. In fact, guys, I've spoken to app developers. I've spoken to some mobile app developers, uh, both Android as well as iOS, and they've in fact told me that when they develop an app, they are required, uh, you know, to to liaise with the operating system in order to get permissions to access your your contacts, your media devices, your photographs, videos, your camera, and so on and so forth. This is why when you install an app. You will see when you start when you before you start using it, your your OS asks you this particular app wants permission to access your contacts, to access your messages. It needs permission to access your gallery, your photos, videos and so on and so forth. And we think that we have control because by clicking on no, it means that that app is not going to access your contacts and so on. Well, for many, many years, this was not the case. This was something that I observed when I spoke to mobile app developers. This was not the case. Permission was by default grant all accesses by default. This was the, the philosophy on the basis of which operating systems were built, mobile mobile apps were developed, and this is a ecosystem under which we were living. 
within the last, I'll say, 10 to 15 years, as mobiles became such, uh, such uh, became so much in terms of mainstream. The advent of privacy has has uh, was kicked in by the introduction of GDPR um, in 2018. What really is privacy? Privacy speaks about how much control do you or me as an individual, how much control do we have over our data as it is being used by organizations, maybe in, uh, in, in a technological ecosystem or maybe even a physical ecosystem. As it is being used by organizations, as it's being used by entities, how much control can we exercise over our own personal data? This is what privacy talks about. And as part of this control, that we have to give, that we have to have, in fact, in terms of our uh, digital well-being. Security falls as a subset. Other areas include transparency, uh, you know, wherein um, organizations have to be completely transparent to the individuals when they are collecting their data. We also have to talk about um, how much consent are we getting from individuals before we start processing their data. What are the rules that we're going to keep in place before we share the data with third parties, before we send it across international borders and so on and so forth. So privacy is all about giving you control over your data. As part of this control, security is a subset and that is by security, I mean cyber security. And cyber security is about the protection of individuals and protection of organizations by ensuring their data is protected essentially. Cyber security can lead to the protection of human life itself to summarize and information security is a subset of cyber security where you're only focused about protection of information assets. All right, so these are the three domains that I wanted to classify on this particular slide. So I hope this answers questions one and two. Is physical security a part of cyber security? Well, the answer to this is yes, because physical security comes in as a part of information security. As long as you cannot ensure your information assets are protected from physical intrusion, from physical theft and so on, you cannot really protect your information itself. Question four, who is responsible for cybersecurity in an organization? CEO, CISO, you, security guard. Of course, you know the answer is you. But let's try to break this question down, right? I mean, there is a concept of responsibility. There is a concept of responsibility and there is a concept of accountability. What is the difference between the two? If you think about it, guys, um, you must have probably heard about the Enron scandal of um, you know, 2000, 2002 and so on. One of the biggest corporate fraud, um, uh, corporate frauds to have come into light, limelight in, in the US. Enron was one of the largest uh, energy companies in the world. It doesn't exist anymore, by the way, uh, thanks to the fraudulent activities that, that you know, came to light. Um, it was it was determined by um, the regulatory bodies, including the SEC and so on in the US, that um, Enron was um, misrepresenting their earnings, uh, underrepresenting their debts, and so on, so as to have an inf inflated, uh, you know, so as to represent inflated um, overall value of the organization. All right. So when this came to light, sometime around 2000, between 2000 and 2002. Uh, the CEO, the CFO, all these guys were arrested. They were taken to jail, of course. And uh, Enron had to, you know, file for bankruptcy and so on. Now, one of the things that these C-level leaders, they said, and I think you know, the CFO was one of these individuals who actually said this, um, was the fact that the fraudulent activities were carried out by the people reporting to him. So he was not really responsible for the fraud because it was the guys who were reporting to him who were carrying out the fraudulent activities. Unfortunately for him, no one was willing to buy this argument in the courts and um, the Sarbanes-Oxley Act, in fact, was, was launched as an outcome of this particular fallout, as an outcome of this accounting scandal. And it clearly laid out the difference between responsibility as well as accountability. So what do you mean by responsibility versus accountability? So yes, the CFO is not responsible for ensuring that the numbers that are being represented, the, the earnings of the organization, they are not fraudulent, rather they are genuine numbers. He's, he's not responsible for that, but he is accountable for ensuring that there is transparency and there is integrity in the financial uh, data that is being reported by Enron itself. So what this means is you as an individual may not be responsible for something, 
but if the team that is responsible for it is you know someone that reports to you then you are accountable for this particular team and you are responsible you are accountable for ensuring that they are doing the job well so for the fourth question we need to revisit it in this particular perspective through this lens and we see that who is responsible for cyber security in an organization every single individual is responsible the CISO is a person who is accountable he is he or she they are accountable for setting up a security strategy setting up cyber security teams and you know ensuring that these teams are carrying out their responsibilities all right so that's how we need to think about it from a from a security perspective the difference between responsibility as well as accountability guys what is the cyber security landscape looking like worldwide a few examples of attacks that we had witnessed over the over past few years kareem one of the biggest in fact the leading um, uh, you know right hailing service here in the UAE, as well as across the Middle East, in fact, they had suffered an attack. Um, in Saudi Arabia, there was an attempt to cause a physical, uh, you know, explosion in one of the petrochemical plants. British Airways suffered a significant attack way back in August, September 2018. 380,000 of their passengers, their data was compromised. I'll tell you about this. And the Cambridge Analytica scandal, one of the most popular scandals that Facebook was, um, uh, you know, was brought to court, in fact, for across the world. What happened in each of these? Well, when Kareem was hacked, ride details pertaining to their customers, including probably their uh, you know usernames, passwords, email IDs, phone numbers, etc. All of this information was compromised because of application level vulnerabilities on the Kareem app itself that people use for booking taxis. What this, a similar kind of vulnerability happened with um, British Airways. However, the impact was much bigger. If you were unfortunate enough to book a ticket on a British Airways flight between, um, I, I think, about June or July 2018 and September 2018, if you had actually visited the BA website to book a flight ticket, you can be sure that your credit card number has been compromised because a group, uh, a hacker group, um, they had actually claimed responsibility for this. They had injected some code on the iframe of this particular page where you enter your card number. This code was siphoning out the debit card as well as credit card numbers, including and also the CVVs, the three digit CVVs. And this these details were, you know, lifted from about 380,000 of people who had booked tickets on British Airways websites during this time. Saudi Arabia had also faced, in fact, Saudi and the UAE are the most targeted countries when it comes to cyber attack, cyber crimes in the world. Um, the reasons are, are are not pretty obvious, but they are pretty uh, clear. We will be talking about this in one of the upcoming slides. Why is it that the UAE and Saudi, in fact, across the Middle East, a lot of the countries, you're a lot, the majority of the cyber criminal activity in the world, you will see it being centered around the Middle East region. For some uh, very clear reasons, we'll talk about this. Um, in March 2018, one of the petrochemical plants in Saudi Arabia, for the first time, we witnessed a cyber attack which had the likelihood to actually impact human lives. There was a new kind of cyber assault wherein um, the attack on a petrochemical plant was launched with the intent of raising the temperature of the boilers, uh, you know, where, you know, you, you boil water with the intent of generating steam and, uh, you know, pushing turbines and so on. Um, the intent was, was to raise the temperature of these boilers to such an extent that a physical explosion would be caused in the plant. Um, this particular incident was foiled because of a small glitch in the code. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been um, investigated su su substantially by, uh, by FireEye as well as other uh, cybersecurity companies, and they've been attributed to some known threat vectors in the world. In 2018, Facebook was fined 500,000 pounds for the Cambridge Analytica scandal. Now, if you have some time, when you switch on Netflix next time, um, look for this movie called The Great Hack, because this movie talks, focuses on the Cambridge Analytica scandal. What really happened here is, uh, is a take on privacy, not so much on cybersecurity. What happened here is uh, there was this one particular uh, student called Alexander Coogan who launched an app and uh, it's an app which was, uh, you know, just like any other app on Facebook, supposed to be a personality test or something. And this was taken up by thousands of users on Facebook. The, the, the problem was anybody who took
this personality test. And when you started playing the, the contacts, your friends list, your posts, and you prepared and said yes, 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 and granted all the questions. But what happened was, unknown to them, as they were playing around with a seemingly harmless um, personality test, the app was harvesting their data as well as data pertaining to their friends. To their this data was harvested and it was, uh, you know, available to Mr. Alexander Kukin, the developer of the app itself. What did he do with it? He sold it to a to a data analytics company called Cambridge Analytica. This organization doesn't exist anymore, but this organization used this data for enabling or structuring the presidential campaign in the, in the United States way back in 2016. So this brought to light a number of criticisms, a lot of allegations in terms of how genuine was the basis on which the presidential campaign was won in the US, right? Um, well, Facebook, again, they tried to wash their hands away by saying, guys, uh, we had nothing to do with this. This is just a third party app. And um, um, the criminal at, uh, that you're looking for is Mr. Alexander Coogan. It is not Facebook. Unfortunately, this argument argument was not bought. And in fact, uh, even Mark Zuckerberg was was called to depose before um, uh, before the Congress, as well as other Facebook C-level executives were pulled in front of uh, you know uh, court hearings in in the UK, in front of the UK Parliament, as well as in Singapore. Mm -hmm. All the arguments focused on the fact that Facebook, you cannot wash your hands away like this. You are the platform that your users are trusting and you are responsible for protecting the privacy of your users. You cannot say that it was a third party app and you know this app didn't, didn't operate in an ethical manner. And in fact, it operated on criminal methods, methodologies. So it is up to you to ensure that the apps on your platform that your users are trusting, they are actually good and not you know engaged in any nefarious activities. All right. So this was the Cambridge Analytica scandal. All right, so no new questions. I was just taking a look. Uh, in terms of my email ID, you would have received an email from me with the meeting link. Nevertheless, I will, um, after this particular meeting, I will share my email ID as well with all of you. All right, so guys, um, I've, I've given you a, a brief description of cybersecurity and how it is different from information security as well as privacy. I've also given you a, a glimpse into the cybersecurity landscape, the number of attacks that, you know, some examples of attacks that we've seen. But what really is the foundation of cybersecurity? Like we saw earlier, information security lies at the heart of cybersecurity because it starts with the protection of information. And what do you do when you need to protect information? You need to understand these three founding or building blocks or these three pillars of information security or cybersecurity itself, which is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. What do I mean by confidentiality? Information is visible only to authorized entities for a definite period of time. So basically, my passwords, my confidential trade secrets, health records of individuals. When I say they have to be kept confidential, what I mean is that they should be visible only to authorized people for a def definite period of time. This is what I mean by confidentiality. I'm, I'm in no way okay with somebody else seeing my password. If I need to share my health records or my trade secrets or my confidential reports, financial records or so on, I need to ensure that it is not readable by everybody. How do I do this? I can go ahead and encrypt it. Or steganography, that's another technology which is used predominantly in military communications. I can use these methodologies for protecting the confidentiality of my information. Integrity is another scenario where information can be seen by everybody, but it cannot be modified by everybody. Only authorized entities can make some changes to the information itself. All right. So if, for example, I want to transfer uh, 5,000 dirhams, as just to give you an example to somebody in this room, I, I really don't have 5,000 dirhams to give you, but just in case, right, as an example. Um, I wish to initiate a financial transaction on my bank that's, that states 5,000 dirhams is to be transferred from account number 123 to account number ABC. The details of this transaction can be seen 
by the individuals who are processing the transaction, those at my bank as well as those at the bank of the uh, receiving party. And of course, the SWIFT payment network if, they are, if this is going to be a SWIFT based financial transfer. So the details can be seen public, but the modification of the financial transaction details should under no circumstances be done by anybody except myself and maybe even the receiving party if he doesn't wish to receive the money or something like this. Right. So this is a scenario where information can be seen, but it should not be modifiable. Another example is your CCTV recordings or your logs that are generated by devices, routers, computers and switches and so on. People might, may be able to see these logs. They may be able to see your camera recordings. But if a cyber criminal is able to go ahead and delete them or make you know, any other changes or alterations, it means integrity is compromised. The next one is availability, which means when people need data, they have access to that data. Take an example of your organization itself. When your employees assume you have, let's say 10,000 employees, when your 10,000 employees come into work in the morning, the most common applications that they might need to access depends on your business. But for an example, let's say they need to access CRM, they need to access ERP, they need to access the online portal through which customers can place requests. They need to um, access their Outlook MS Office applications. If a criminal wants to hamper the productivity of an organization, all he needs to do is go and target these applications. CRM, banking, internet banking is another example. Employees access to Outlook or so on and so forth. By causing an outage of these systems, he can negatively impact the productivity of your employees and thereby have a direct impact, negative impact, of course, on your organization's bottom line and revenues. Now take the simple example and extrapolate it to bigger sectors. Air traffic, for example. In fact, this is a, a real incident that happened in the airline sector, wherein the availability of systems was compromised with the intent of affecting the revenue of an airline itself. I'll talk about this example briefly. Um, I don't know if you've heard about this airline called Lot Airlines, L-O-T. Even I hadn't heard about them until um, they became popular for the reason of this particular attack. Well, it's a, it's a, it's an airline carrier based in Poland. It's a Polish airline car um, airline. And a um, few years ago, they suffered a devastating attack. How this attack played out, I'll quickly tell you. Before any aircraft takes off, the pilots, they have to generate what we call a flight plan. Normally, they carry a tablet uh, specifically into the cockpit. Uh, and they generate a flight plan which has to be approved by the air traffic controller. The flight plan will have details about the, the proposed or the estimated uh, time of departure, the estimated time of arrival, um, what is the path, what is the route that we're going to take between source and destination points, uh, what is the cruising altitude, what is the maximum altitude that we will get to and so on and so forth. All of the different parameters of the flight of the of the of that particular journey that is to be taken by the flight this will be included in the flight plan and only once the flight plan is approved by the air traffic controller will the pilot have the clearance for takeoff now as you can imagine in a particular airport there's going to be an n number of flights taking off and landing at a given point of time there is one central server which is synchronizing the flight plans across all of these different aircraft and this server is controlled by the air traffic controller, of course. This single central server was compromised. And this attack was directed against Lot Airlines because they had the largest number of aircraft landing and taking away from, you know, taking off from this particular airport in, uh, in Poland. And uh, as a result of this particular outrage, they had a downtime of nine hours and, uh, you know, I think 12 flights were canceled, 16 flights were delayed or something like this. Um, the revenue loss faced by the airline as a result of this nine hours of downtime was in the excess of half a billion dollars, right? So, uh, I mean, if you consider a lot of factors um, in in Europe, if, the, if an airline is, uh, if, an, if a flight is canceled, you, the airline is required to, you know, compensate the passengers if the cancellation was on, uh, was a fault of the airline itself and not that of the uh, passengers. So take those factors into account, take the fact the flights were grounded, the cancellation and so on and so forth. The overall revenue loss 
comes out to the tune of close to half a billion dollars in simply nine hours. All right. So guys, this was a significant attack. And in fact, if you did a little bit of digging around, you will see that the date of the attack was timed just one day before Lot Airlines was supposed to launch a press conference. And this press conference was supposed to introduce to the world, announce to the world the fact that Lot Airlines is introducing new new flights between Poland as well as Switzerland and Germany and so on. So they had huge expansion plans they were, and they were just about to announce them in this press conference, but on the previous day they got hacked. So you can imagine this probably was the act of a comp competing organization. They must have hired some hackers or so on. We never really know uh, because it's not been made public by the airline themselves. All right. So um, this is a scenario which plays out very, very often in the corporate sector, wherein organizations hack their own com competitors, sometimes even just, you know, one or two days prior to uh, a critical date, like the launch of a new product, the acquisition of a new organization, or a press conference like we saw in the case of Lot Airlines. Availability of systems when they are compromised can have a huge impact on the on the um, bottom line of the organization. Other sectors include uh, e-commerce, logistics, shipping, transport, and all of these as well, which where you know a lot of the systems they operate on the basis of just-in-time updates, just-in-time uh, information. Take the case of Amazon.com, um, for example or internet banking applications. Uh, if these systems are fa you know, facing a downtime of even just a few minutes, it translates to a huge value of dollar loss for the organization. All right. So basically, when confidentiality, integrity, and availability are compromised, you will see that you have a cybersecurity incident. In fact, guys, any cybersecurity attack that you see, any, any cyber attack that you'll see in the world, you can boil it down to the compromise of one of these three factors, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. When confidentiality is compromised, you have the number one here, which is disclosure. Information is leaked. This is pretty much all the most common cyber attacks that you will see. Where in um, the case of British Airways, we spoke about 380,000 of their passengers, credit card details being compromised. We spoke about Kareem, where passengers um, email addresses, phone numbers, and even physical location addresses, all of this was compromised. By the way, Karim had clarified that payment information was not compromised as part of this particular attack. So what happened here is information that is supposed to have been kept confidential, like you see over here in this particular slide, information is visible only to authorized entities. That principle of security was compromised. Modification, like I said earlier, information is visible to, our, to entities, but modifications or changes are being carried out by unauthorized persons in an unauthorized way. That is where integrity of information is compromised. Um, simple example that you see over here is a Volkswagen scandal, wherein the emissions uh, brought about by the, by, the, um, by the cars manufactured by the company in the US, these emission numbers were found to be falsified in order to ensure compliance with the regulatory norms in the country. Um, and so there was a huge scandal which rocked the world of Volkswagen when the scandal came to light. Destruction is when availability is compromised. We spoke about airlines, internet banking, logistics, Amazon.com, e-commerce and so on sectors where information is available to authorized individuals on a just-in-time basis. When this availability is compromised, you have destruction, which can translate to a direct loss of revenue for the organizations. We see an example here of uh, British Airways baggage handling system facing a global crash as a result of which passengers bags were not returned to them and a lot of them were left unattended. Right. So guys, uh, this is where we complete the basics of cybersecurity. Quick milestone for everybody here in 2012, Saudi Aramco, we suffered the biggest cyber attack in the history of the world, which was when a virus called Shamoon wiped data on 35,000 computers and literally, literally paralyzed the business. What was compromised in this particular attack? CIRA. The second question, which of the following is compromised when a bank's customer's card numbers are breached? Again, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Feel free to use the chat window and type in your answers. We'll take about 30 seconds for this for this slide.
All right. Let's see the answers. Perfect. So Kumail has answered that the first one is availability. Manish Mahapatra, availability and confidentiality. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Your answers are perfectly correct. The first one is Saudi Aramco attack, wherein data was wiped out of 35,000 computers, literally paralyzing the business. What is compromised was absolutely availability because data was not available to authorized employees when they needed it. In fact, this was the, the, only because it was Aramco was the organization able to you know, recover from this attack. The scale of this attack was unprecedented. Um, and Aramco decided not to reuse these 35,000 hard disks that were that were impacted. Rather, they decided to purchase new hard disks. And there was such a huge spike in demand only from Aramco for, for uh, new hard disks that uh, the price of hard disks temporarily shot up in the world, uh, in the market. All right. The second question is what is compromised when a bank's card numbers are breached? It's confidentiality, like many of you have rightly pointed out. Thank you so much for this. It's confidentiality because the card numbers have to be uh, kept confidential at all points of time, but rather they are compromised. And uh, so, yes, guys, thank you so much. The answers are A as well as C. Thank you so much. All right, with this, let's move on to the second module, or rather the first one in terms of numbers. Welcome to the world of cybersecurity. So, guys, um, in terms of cybersecurity, you will note that the Middle East region is one of the most targeted in the world. Um, there are websites uh, where you can track cyber, you know, malicious traffic as it flows from one part of the world to the other. Um, these are, you know, threat maps where you can see who are the threat actors and where are they present. And they're being monitored 24-7 uh, by companies like Kaspersky, like, like FireEye and so on. When you go onto their website, you can, you can see through these threat maps where the traffic is originating from and you'll see where it is landing. You'll see that the Middle East happens to be a hotbed of cyber attacks because we are being targeted here in the Middle East by criminal organizations all around the world. A lot of reasons for this. Um, the first and most obvious, of course, is the availability of rewards. Yes, um, in terms of cash, of course, there's a lot of cash present in the region, um, considering the economic wealth of the region. So this is priority number one for cyber criminals, the availability of wealth, the availability of rewards. This tends to motivate them to launch a number of attacks against organizations in the region. But the other challenges that we face in the region is that awareness is still not at an all-time high. Um, like I said, I've been here in uh, Ingram Micro for the last three years, and since the last three years, we've worked significantly with a lot of organizations. At least I've worked, you know, a lot with a lot of organizations through Ingram Micro, spreading the message of security, ensuring that awareness levels are updated or are upgraded. Despite this, of course, it's not enough. There's a lot of work to be done in terms of improving the awareness levels of, of organizations as well as the people within the organizations. Simple mistakes carried out by employees have led to the biggest, biggest attacks. In fact, the Aramco uh, incident that we just spoke about in the previous slide, um, well, the actual reason for this particular attack has not been officially uh, announced, but well, there are two theories, one of which states that um, it was an employee who you know, clicked on a phishing link by mistake. This is theory number one. And theory number two is an employee plugged in a, a USB stick which carried, you know, malicious traffic, malicious payload. He plugged it, plugged it into the network and that led to the attack. Legislation wise, um, well, this depends on which country you're talking about in the Middle East. In the UAE, we have a federal cyber criminal law, which, uh, you know, which strictly calls out criminal penalties, including fines up to three million dirhams as well as jail time for engaging in any cyber criminal activities. So legislation wise, um, the UAE has some strong laws. Uh, even Saudi Arabia, there are some strong laws around uh, cyber criminal activities. Other countries in the Middle East are still, you know, predominantly catching up. We are seeing that the leg legal framework is still not strictly enforced or, or it's even not uh, present in many countries that you have here in the Middle East. All right. Security implementation, even when awareness is up, even when le when the law requires that, you know, um, security has to be um, uh, embedded across organizations operations, actual on the ground implementation of cyber security. This is a challenge which is not unique to only the Middle East, rather to the entire world itself, where an actual strict enforcement and implementation of cyber security best practices, it's never, never 
forget about 100%. It's never never even 90% in most of the organizations. And the 10% is a huge window of opportunity for cyber criminals to penetrate into an organization. Right? So guys, um, this being the um, you know typical reasons why the Middle East is a, cha is, is a top target, what are the typical approaches that you will face to cybersecurity when you approach your management? Uh, you know, uh, trying to sell to them the need to invest in a security solution, in a cybersecurity strategy. Many organizations, they still operate under the, the, the misinformed notion that cybersecurity is a technology issue and it has to be delegated to your IT team. Cybersecurity has, a, has an extensive focus on technology. But you know as well as me by now that security is not a technology issue. Rather, it is a business issue. It is a business problem. It's not a technology problem. And business means including your people, including your processes and including your technologies. Right. So which comes first? That is up to the organization to decide. But uh, I would say start with your people because they are the individuals who have to run everything that the organization does. Once you have enabled your people, through ongoing awareness, ongoing training sessions and so on, on the best practices of, of security. By the way, these are practices that we are going to cover as part of this training. Once you enable them, then you define what are the technology tools that are going to help them to follow the security best practices that you have enabled them on. After you invest in the tools, you define the processes that will govern the way people use these tools and information flows through people as well as through these tools. Right? So you need to have a holistic approach. You can't just say, hey, cybersecurity is a tech issue. I'm just going to buy a firewall. I have antivirus. Guys, believe me, these are the kinds of responses that we've commonly heard when we speak to organizations, including C-level stuff. And uh, you know, they, they misunderstand the, the subject. They don't realize that it can start with just one uh, you know, ill-informed employee clicking on a, on a phishing link. Identity theft, business email compromise, a lot of such incidents we see. Ransomware, again, we will come to this. This is one of the most common forms of cyber attack that we're seeing in this region in, in the Middle East. Um, and in nine out of 10 cases, I've seen the organization had zero cybersecurity strategy before they were hit. They didn't even know what cybersecurity was. They, had an, they have an IT team, of course, and um, you know all tasks pertaining to security are delegated to this IT team. When I say all tasks, this is normally limited to an antivirus or maybe a firewall, but that's about it. They don't have anything beyond this uh, in terms of security best practices, and then they get hit, and that's when you know uh, all the uh, uh, bells start ringing. All right, so security is as much about people and processes as it is about technology. It is not an issue to be addressed with stopgap solutions. Rather, it has to be uh, embedded by design into the culture of the organization itself. And you will see that people tell you, hey, we've installed some cybersecurity products, so therefore we are secure. We have invested in antivirus, we've invested in uh, firewalls and so on. But security, you will see it is not just, it's not something which is, uh, uh, you know, solved by investing in one or two solutions. Rather, it touches upon multiple disciplines. You need to have governance, you need to have application security, risk and compliance, physical security, incident management. There are a lot of subsets within security that you need to address. Just because you invested in antivirus, it doesn't mean that your incident management is in place. Absolutely not. Have you taken a strategy towards risk and compliance in terms of risk assessment? What are the compliance requirements for your organization? Have you addressed those? In most cases, the answer is no. What about the applications of your organization? Are they secure? What is the data that they're collecting and so on? All of these questions have to be answered as well. Another risk response that you will typically hear is, you know what, only our employees are allowed to access this information. Um, so we are OK with them accessing it. We trust our employees holistically. Trusting your employees is good. It's it's a great way to build a positive organizational culture. But from a security perspective, we always tell you trust, but verify. Trust, but monitor. These are the principles that you have to have. So giving them trust is good, but always, always monitor them or always, always verify the claims that are raised by your employees. How do you verify these? There are principles called, for instance, separation of duties. We will talk about this as we go down the slides. Another approach that you will see is that, that you will see is 
um, you have one person who has been hired to take care of your organization's security program. This person is the guy that you see over here, the single point of failure. So maybe 50% of his time he spends on, uh, you know, building your ISO 27001 ISMS and that's your security program. The remaining 50% of the time he is taking care of legal frameworks or he's working with the IT team. Maybe he's, an, he's a network person or something like this. So just for the sake of having ISO 27001 compliance, I've seen this in many smaller companies. We have only one person who is tasked with the entire security strategy of the organization. Now, there's nothing wrong with this approach, but all I will say is ensure that you have a backup plan because in case this person resigns or in case this person leaves or, you know, he's on, um, he takes a leave um, for uh, one or two weeks, let's say, as, as a vacation, your security program does not collapse entirely. So you need to have some sort of backup plan, some sort of fallback or contingency mechanism and uh, not have everything, you know, falling down to one person. Like you see here, this individual is responsible for audit, incident management, exception management, VAPT, GRC, everything pertaining to one individual. It's not a best practice approach and you need to have some sort of distribution of all the activities. Who are the cyber criminals? Guys, now when I talk about cyber security, um, we need to look at two sides of the coin. The first side is you and me as individuals, as well as the organizations that are, you know, supporting us as individuals, as professionals. This is one side of it. And how is it that we can protect the information pertaining to these organizations that we work for? The other side is the cyber criminals, the so-called bad guys against whom we are trying to protect our organizational assets. Who are these cyber criminal, criminal individuals, cyber criminal organizations that you see? Typically, when you're trying to categorize your cyber criminal groups, you have to understand what is their motive, who is their target, what are their resources? So you need to understand why do they do what they do? Who are they targeting in terms of their attacks? And how well equipped are they to carry out their attacks? Their motive and their means. This is what we need to break down. When you do this, you will see that there are two types of attackers. Those who launch targeted attacks and those who do opportunistic attacking. The targeted attackers are the more, uh, you know, forces to be reckoned with because they are more dangerous. They have very good access to, uh, you know, money as and as a result of this, they have they have the ability to train their 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 teams on how to carry out uh, cyber attacks or, uh, you know, cyber criminal activities against organizations. Um, cost is not so much of a constraint for them, rather they focus on result. They can be nation state state sponsored attacker groups. They can be terrorist organizations. They can be organized cyber criminal groups. They have different motives. Some of them are looking to uh, hamper critical infrastructures of, of countries um, um, for political reasons, for example. Some of them might be trying to advocate their own terrorist agendas. Some of them are cyber criminal groups which are only looking at making money. Like, for example, they sell stolen credit card information, stolen health information, etc. And uh, through this, they try to say, try to make money. A lot of these organizations are alive as well as very, very active, alive and kicking, I would say, in a part of the world of, of the world which is called um, the dark web. We look at you guys just to understand what it is. So the targeted attackers are the groups to be reckoned with, the forces to be reckoned with. The opportunistic attackers, on the other hand, are the guys who they've read about hacking. They know how to purchase tools through which they can launch attacks and um, they don't really have the uh, the coding knowledge or the prior or the uh, technical knowledge to launch advanced attacks. Um, so, for instance, they send out phishing mails to hundreds of email addresses and they hope that at least two of them click things like this. So these guys are normally called the script kiddies um, and many, many attacks that I've seen in the region have been launched by opportunistic people who have you know, uh, they are not specifically targeted against one or two victim uh, organizations. Rather, they are just sent out against a whole group of companies, and they just we, uh, hope that one of them will pay the money that they are, that is being demanded as as uh, as an outcome of, for example, a ransomware attack. Right. So they are looking predominantly for fame, reputation, a uh, little bit of money, or so on. They don't have so much in terms of technical skills, competencies. They have access to licensed hacking tools, ransomware as a service, for example. These are the kinds of tools that these guys have started using 
extensively and how do they do this? How do they play uh, and get access to these tools? This is on the dark web. We'll talk about this briefly. Guys, welcome to the dark web. Now, before I start talking about the dark web, let me let me uh, reiterate the fact that here in the UAE, as well as many parts of the world, accessing the dark web is 100% illegal. So the purpose of this particular slide, this particular section is to edu educate you on what is the dark web and um, help us to understand how is it that it works from a technical standpoint. There's a lot of illegal activities that are carried out on the dark web and by no means are you to access or to you know uh, try to engage yourselves in these. Let me please make this very clear because in many parts of the world, including here in the UAE, it is 100% illegal to access the dark web. That being said, what really is the dark web? Let me ask you a simple question. When is the last time you tried to Google something when you when you Google something? Maybe it was five seconds ago. Maybe it was one hour ago. Maybe it was yesterday. Every time you Google something, have you thought about the process that unfolds? Right? Um, what are the steps that happen in the background every time you Google something? We never give it any additional thought. We know that Google's algorithm is very, very strong and in fact, this is the reason the company is, um, uh, you know, shot to its position, number one position that it is today, because of the extreme accuracy with which search results are thrown by the page ranking algorithm of Google. What is a page ranking algorithm, guys? The founders of Google, um, uh, Sergi, Sergi Brin, and Eric, the other guy, when they uh, when they were in university, they wrote an algorithm called the page ranking algorithm, which uh, the way in which it worked was. When you're typing a search query, let's say, for example, I'm searching for um, leading e-commerce websites in the UAE. This is the search query that I type for. How it returns my results, the page ranking algorithm, it queries the World Wide Web and it sees, first of all, pages whose header have the exact search phrase that I typed, leading e-commerce websites in the UAE. If it is there in the header itself, then that's probably it's going to give it a higher rank. If it is there, the exact words are there in the body of that of this particular web page. That is that's going to give it a higher rank. Um, the recency of the content in the web page. How recent was it? Um, you know, when was it last updated? To put it simply, um, the reference to this particular web page in other websites, which means it's a it's a popular website. It has links in other website in other websites and so on. All of these and n number of other factors. They take up. They come into the picture and they associate a rank to this web page in relation to your search query, right? And this uh, this algorithm obviously works a lot more in detail than what I just described, but it's really good at what it does. And that's the reason Google is what it is today in terms of search. But what you must have noticed in this particular process, when this, when you type your search query, the web pages that are scanned, the, the web pages that are scoped in as part of your search, these are all public facing web pages. How this how they get scoped in is by a process called spidering, wherein um, our, what we call tiny bots, they crawl across the publicly accessible worldwide web, public web pages, and only these public web pages will be scoped in for the entire search activity. What if there was an email on your company's email server and that email had the exact same search words, search phrases that you're searching for? Obviously, that's not going to be returned on a Google search. The reason is that data on your company's email, even if it is available on Office 365, even if it is available on your Gmail, it is protected by a username and a password, right? So there is a level of authentication that someone has to go through before they have access to that email. This part of the World Wide Web, which is accessible to anybody publicly, is what we call the surface web. It's not the entire Internet. It's only a portion of the Internet, if you think about it. Information that is accessible through public repositories, through public methods, including Google search, forms what we call the surface web that you see right here. The next layer where you need some level of authentication before you access the data is what we call the deep web. All right, so it's the same part of the Internet, of course, and uh, the World Wide Web. It's just that in order to access this data, you need to authenticate yourself, you need to prove your identity. One example is email. Another example is a LinkedIn group, which is closed 
So not everybody can see what goes on in this group. The, the content and the discussions and the forums on this particular group is visible only to authorized authenticated members. Um, this is in contrast with open groups, for example, where the discussions, the posts and so on are completely open to anybody. They can even be included in Google searches. Similarly, your posts that you make on Facebook, you can make these public posts and you can have a setting where it is searchable using Google or any other search uh, engine, or you have the ability to make it visible only to your friends or you know only to yourself. So different settings of visibility that you can enable for your posts, depending upon the level of visibility that you enable on it, um, that content is going to be considered to be a part of the surface web or the deep web. So it's just information that is open and information that is restricted. This is the difference between surface and deep web. But what really is a dark web? Assume that one of us here is a cyber criminal. I hope, I really hope not, but just for the sake of discussion, right? As a cyber criminal, I have some skills. This individual has some skills in, um, uh, uh, you know, in, in terms of launching cyber attacks and so on. But he wants to make additional money. He wants to sell those skills and put his skills up for hire. I am a hacker and someone can hire me. This is the, this is the person's uh, intention. If he wants to do this, he's obviously not going to go up on Amazon. He's not going to go up on Dubisil or some website and you know put his skills up. Obviously not. Even though his profile is protected by username and password, only authorized users of Dubisil can see him. It's not enough. Obviously, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. What he would do is he would operate on a part of the web where his identity is 100%, I wouldn't say 99.5, I would say 100% untraceable. This is a part of the web that is called the dark web, wherein not only is your identity confidential, your location is virtually untraceable. What is this part of this web that we call the dark web? How does it work? Let me, let me take you on this particular slide to explain this to you. Now, on the simple surface net, Assume that you are a user on a laptop and you're trying to access a website, which is google.com. The process that unfolds, you open your browser and you type www.google.com. So when you type this request, it is understood by your ISP and uh, the IP address is, resol is resolved or www.google.com is resolved to the corresponding IP address. Your request flows through the internet and accesses and it reaches its corresponding servers of Google and the home page of Google is thrown back onto your laptop or your computer within a matter of seconds. Let's imagine that you're using the browser, which is Chrome in this particular case. OK. Type a web, a web page which looks like this www. lot of nonsense dot onion. This is a typical way in which web pages on the dark web are structured. You don't have any .com or .org, .gov, .edu, .ae, none of these kinds of extension or domain names. You don't have those kinds of um, uh, extensions. Rather, you have the .onion extension. These kinds of web pages are obviously not understood by Chrome. Chrome will not understand when you say www.abc.onion. In order to access these kinds of web pages, you will need a special browser like for instance, Tor. Tor stands for the Onion Router. It's the most, it's in fact the de facto browser of uh, of the dark web, although it's not the best in terms of um, effect, or in terms of, for example, speed. There are other options like I2P and Freenet. The Tor or the Onion Router works on the basis of routing traffic between your computer and other computers which use Tor as well installed on them, which have Tor installed on them. The traffic is routed across these packet, these uh, you know points, I would say, or nodes, and then it reaches this particular address, which is www.nonsense.onion. Specific browsers have been designed for accessing these .onion web pages. All right. Now, what's the beauty of this whole mechanism is the path that is chosen is extremely random and it is never the same. Sorry. The path is extremely random. It is never the same. This is one one area where you uh, ensure that you know um, you are virtually untraceable, but that's not even the beginning of it. What happens is, 
For every hop that the packet goes through between source and destination, the packet undergoes one layer of encryption. All right. This is why we call it the onion router. What do I mean by this, guys? Let me explain this over here on the next slide. Assume that you have a message which says, um, call me. This is a message that you want to send. OK. When you initiate this message from your source, from your source IP address, it jumps through a random path that I just showed you on the previous slide. There can be as many as 6,000 hops included on this particular path. For every hop, there is a layer of encryption that the packet has to, and, and the packet has to be decrypted at every single hop before the clear text packet is available at the destination. There can be as many as 6,000 hops between source and destination. So what happens is, before the packet is sent from source to destination, it will be encrypted 6,000 times. 6,000 layers of encryption, and then it is sent through a random path. At every hop, one layer of encryption is removed. So layer one is decrypted at node one, layer two is decrypted at node two, layer three is decrypted by node three. Finally, at the final node, you will have the clear text packet, the clear text message. All right, so only this final node, which again is very, very randomly selected, only this one node will have the clear text message. All the other nodes, they will have encrypted messages. They can only remove one layer of encryption. They don't know the source, they don't know the destination. They only know the previous hop and the next hop in terms of routing the packet. That's about it. So the path is extremely random, like you saw over here, as well as the number of layers of encryption is so high that it is virtually impossible to trace who the sender is and who the destination is. So it is virtually impossible to detect who are the individuals behind the traffic packets that you see on the dark web. So when you think about it, the dark web is still a part of the World Wide Web. It's just that the pages are structured differently and they can be accessed only through different browsers, like for example, Tor, I2, I2P, as well as Freenet and so on. Again, I'll reiterate, accessing the dark web is 100% illegal in this country, in the UAE, as well as many other parts of the world. So please do not access it by yourself under any circumstances, um, because it is, a, it, it is illegal to do so. The dark web is not used only for nefarious purposes. It is also used by whistleblowers who want to, uh, you know, report against the Ill Ill illegal activities happening in their countries. Um, media organizations, human rights groups, even law enforcement agencies, all of these organizations, entities are still active on the dark web for tracking and keeping a finger on the pulse of terrorist groups, terrorist organizations and so on. Uh, but yes, there is a large chunk of cyber criminal activities uh, illegal activities, etc., that happen on the dark web as well. All right. When I say illegal activities, like I said, you can hire hackers, you can purchase banned substances, stolen usernames, passwords, fake passports, and so on. A lot of these illicit activities can be um, easily executed using the dark web itself. All right. So, guys, this was a this was a quick introduction to the world of the cyber criminals on the dark web. We are not going to jump straight into the basic concepts. And then we will um, we'll take a short break around uh, 12 o'clock, uh, if that's okay with everybody. We'll continue for some time now. At 12, we'll reach the exact midpoint of the training. So we'll take a quick break at that particular point. All right, now let's see where we are in terms of the overall agenda. So we've completed three pillars. We've completed the world of cybersecurity. We're jumping straight into section two, which is fundamentals. We're gonna start with the basic concepts, all right? Let me see if there are any questions. All right. There's a question from Mr. Uh, Manish Mahapatra. Thank you, Manish. Uh, the question is, does the dark web run on blockchain technology? Um, all right, so the answer to this uh, question, Manish, the straight answer is no. The dark web does not run on blockchain. Uh, blockchain is a, is a wholly different ecosystem, but there's a lot of parallels that you will see between dark web as well as, as, well as blockchain because um, dark web is, is, is built on the principles of encryption as well as random paths, whereas blockchain is built on the principle of hashing, wherein um, uh, you, know, you have a number of transactions which are coupled together to form a block, and then they are linked to each other through a hashing mechanism, so this, this link can never be removed itself. All right, but one of the relationships between dark web and blockchain, you will see that 
blockchain enabled uh, the rise of cryptocurrencies and this rise of cryptocurrency has enabled cyber criminal groups on the dark web to bring about the commercial aspect of their operations what does it mean in the dark web i'm completely anonymous you cannot trace me and i'm selling you something now you need to pay me at the end of the day when i'm a cyber criminal right how do i get the payment blockchain bitcoins etc are actually helping me to carry this out all right so there is a huge uh, interrelationship wherein uh, blockchain is powering the dark web economy um, we from ingram micro we've actually done a lot of sessions and trainings including on youtube you'll find this wherein we studied the relationship between the dark web as well as blockchain all right uh, the other question is from amit kumar what is the importance of dark web these days uh, so amit thank you again for this uh, great question so dark web still is uh, very very significant to us um, uh, from from a national security perspective, uh, no matter which country I'm speaking about, uh, from a national security perspective, as well as from an organizational security perspective, because you see cyber criminal uh, groups excessively active, as well as inviting you know participants on a day-to-day -day basis, um, soliciting at, uh, attendance as well as activities on their platforms. Um, there are a lot of websites, including, for example, the Silk Road, it's uh, you can call it the Amazon of the dark web because uh, pretty much anything illegal that you want um, can be you know taken for can be purchased on the dark web on this particular platform called the Silk Road. There are a lot of such e-commerce websites. There are a lot of cyber criminal groups with with uh, you know telephone based call center support and so on that operate on the dark web. So the importance is something which is uh, on the scale of national security perspective itself. It's not something that can be undermined at any part of time. Um, other question by Ashok Kumar, which part of the ISO model does it uh, affect more? So uh, Ashok, I don't, uh, I, I, I'm sorry, but I didn't understand the question. Are you talking about the OSI model uh, or are you talking about the um, ISO 27001 standards? Let, let us know, please. Um, we'll come back to this, Ashok. And um, moving on, we'll go on to the question, to the basic concepts in section two. Right, so in this section, we're gonna explore quickly about the two basic concepts of cybersecurity or information security itself. The first one is access control management, and the second one is risk management. Now, um, in we'll start with the, the principle of access control management because it is fundamental to any cybersecurity framework, any information security framework. The intent here is to ensure that information is accessible, information is visible only to authorized individuals. And how do you make this auditable? How do you make sure that the principle of accountability is protected? How do you make sure the principle of authentication of individuals is also protected at all points of time? So in order to break this down, you should always uh, understand there are two, two players in this ecosystem. The first one is a subject. The second one is the object, right? So for our, for our uh, understanding, we'll keep it very simple. Object is something that is going to be accessed and let's take that as data. So this one right here is the object. Subject is, and it can be a user, it can be a system, it can be a firewall, an application, it can be a laptop, desktop, anything, which is requesting access to the object. When I say access, it is asking to either read the object, make some changes to the object, delete the object, and so on. All right. So when you talk about the interaction between a subject and an object, there are three principles that always have to be upheld. The subject has to authenticate itself, verify that it is who it claims to be, verify its identity. There has to be a principle of authorization. All right, you've proven your identity. For your specific role, what are the permissions that you're going to have available? This is called validation of permissions. The last one is accountability, which means you've carried out some actions on the, sub on the object. How can I prove in future that you only had carried out those actions, which means how can I have logs, for example, to correlate your actions to your identity? All right. These three principles should always be always be built, should always be executed before the subject is able to access the object. Authentication, authorization, accountability. Again, to repeat, authentication is validation of your identity. Simple example, I type www.gmail.com and I claim that my um, user ID is, uh, you know, abc at gmail.com. But I verified, I authenticate myself by typing the password, which is something that I'm supposed to know as the user who is abc at gmail.com. So that is authentication. 
The second one is authorization. As a user, abc.com, you have access to your inbox only. You don't have access to anybody else's inbox. That is your authorization, your permissions levels, right? So th that is where authorization comes into the picture. And the last one is accountability, wherein you have logs to, to record your actions on that particular mailbox, which is, for example, gmail.com. You can see a log of your activities in future to ensure that your identity is tied to those actions that you carried out. All right. When I say authentication, there are three ways in which you can do it. You can either type in your password. You can either show something that you have, or you can either present a part of your physio physiological or physical being itself. What do I mean by this? You type in something you know, which means it's a password. So, um, when you're trying to access a particular application, it asks you to enter a password, so that you know the password and you type it. You try to access a system and it asks you to swipe a card, something that you have, or it asks you to enter the token based on the uh, RSA token that has already been given to you. What is the number token that was generated on your token? This is something that you have. The last one is something that you are, which is nothing but biometrics. You need to either scan your fingerprint or you need to uh, speak and your voice is authenticated or you need to uh, perform a retinal scan so that the door um, is open for you. Things like this. So the, there are different ways in which you can verify your identity of um, verify the identity of a subject. When you have more than one of these ways that are, that are implemented, then you have what we call multi-factor authentication. What do I mean by multi-factor authentication? I will ask you to for example, type in a password and then present your fingerprint. Or I will say, um, you know, present a card and then type in a password. So something that you have as well as something that you know. When I have more than one of these dimensions mandatorily included as part of my authentication mechanism, I call it multi-factor authentication, right? So let's take a simple question over here. Which of the following is an example of multi-factor authentication? Take a good look at this question, guys. Uh, Salik, uh, for those who are not from uh, the GCC, Salik is nothing but toll. Automated toll for vehicles on the highways here uh, in the UAE. Take 30 seconds and, uh, and try to address this question. All right, we got some beautiful answers already. So the question again is, uh, which of the following is an example of multi-factor authentication? So some of us have answered that the correct answer is number one. And uh, some of us have said that the correct answer is number two. Let's try to break it down. So you're logging into Windows by typing in your username and password. Then you're opening Outlook. And again, Outlook is asking you for a username and password, which is a different username and password. So is that multi-factor authentication? Some of us feel that it is. The second one is withdrawing cash from an ATM machine. Some of us feel that this is a correct answer. The third one is Salik. Um, what happens here in Salik? If for those who are you know not in the in the region, just in case you are not aware, I will quickly introduce you to this. So we have uh, Salik gates or so-called toll gates installed at multiple points on the highway, and um, on your cards you simply stick um, uh, you know an RFID tag which is read by the toll gates as your car drives through uh, under the toll under, under the gate and um, you are uniquely identified and a toll is charged to your account easily a lot of countries have already started implementing this uh, and very very fast effective ways of paying toll without having to you know wait in long queues and so on so this is one side of it which of these falls in the area of multi-factor authentication now you can easily rule out salik because uh, it is only a single factor of authentication which is your RFID tag that is stuck onto your windscreen. So Salik is not the right answer. Logging into Windows and then logging into MS Outlook. So you have two instances where you're entering a username and password. First for Windows, secondly for Outlook. Let's go back to the slide. When you enforce two or more of the above, you call it multi-factor authentication. So in this particular example, you enter a username and password for Windows, 
again you enter the username and password for outlook so you still done something that you know it's just that you've done it twice you've not invoked something that you have you've not invoked something that you are so for this reason this question is sorry this option one is not the correct one when you withdraw cash from an atm machine you will enter a pin and you'll also of course present your card which means you have something that you know your pin and you also present your debit card which is something that you have this is a correct answer because it is invoking something that you know as well as something that you have this is an example of multi-factor authentication so thank you guys for your answers very very insightful uh, i hope this you know helped you to uh, break down the definition of multi-factor authentication all right let's move on to the next domain which is authorization so we spoke about authentication we spoke about authorization we'll we'll Okay. Authentication is where you verify the identity. We just spoke about it right now. What is authorization? Now that you've verified the identity, what are the levels of permission that you wish to give to this individual? You're going to see that quickly in this particular slide. All right. Within an organizational context, you, you technically, you know, in a very high level, you'll have three kinds of users, general users, admin users, and external users. So internal users are, of course, general as well as admin. General users have basic access. They are the users of a system. Uh, they are required to carry out their activities on this particular system. For example, CRM, the sales guys are expected to access the CRM. They are expected to um, receive sales requests. Uh, uh, purchase uh, POs, invoices, etc. They are required to process these through the CRM system. But any privileged activities on the CRM, for instance, if an account is uh, needs to be deleted and so on, they wouldn't be doing it. This has to be carried out by designated administrators or admins. So depending upon the role, the levels of permission will differ within the organization itself. So this is to ensure that people do not misuse their levels of privileges. The designations are clearly defined the privileges are clearly uh, delineated in this particular manner. Similarly, you have external users. The most that you can give them is, for example, access to the Internet uh, and, you know, the public Internet itself and any other publicly accessible websites of your organization. But internal portals, internal applications, etc. typically they should not have access because they are not, of course, employees. They might not even be contractors. If they need any access, they will have to go through the escalation of privilege process wherein they raise a request and get the access provision for them. Role based access control should be, you know, access is given in line to people's job profiles itself. For example, IT should not have access to view the CCTV recordings of a, of a particular facility. This is one of the most common areas where you'll see different disciplines, different teams working together. When you go to the physical security team, the CCTV camera recordings are required to be stored for 30 days, 90 days, maybe even six, three to six months. The security team is responsible for ensuring that CCTV cameras are functioning and that they are recording, um, you know, the, the critical areas of the organization. But the IT team is responsible for ensuring that the cam, the servers are supposed, the, the servers are supporting these systems as and when they are required to be, uh, you know, stored. If, for example, a server runs out of space, they are responsible for either deleting the outdated recordings or taking a backup and ensuring that there is sufficient space, the IT team. But does the IT have the need to look into what goes on the CCTV recordings? Sometimes these recordings can include the IT team itself. So that level of privilege has to be clearly defined between different teams. This is what we call role-based access control. Okay? Principle of least privileges and need to know are two of the most defining principles when we talk about when you talk about authorization. When I say principle of least privileges, what I mean is I will give access to an op, to a subject only the most basic access that he needs in order to carry out the job requirements that have been defined for him. All right, I'll talk I'll talk about this in um, in little more detail. Suppose a company has hired a new person, a new joining, and this person has joined the, um, let's say, the business development team. By default, this person should have access to nothing. 
when he starts uh, when he joins his company. After joining, he can raise a request and get access to applications, systems, physical environments pertaining to his team, his business development team. By default, everything is deny all. He has to go through this privilege escalation process to get additional privileges to carry out his job descriptions. Need to know is the other principle wherein users authentication is in line with business requirements. When someone is asking for permissions, give them access only to permissions or, or permit them to access only the systems where they have a legitimate need to know or business case in terms of need to see need to know. Let's look at this example. A marketing executive requires access to Facebook, access to Twitter, so as to make some marketing noise about an upcoming product launch. She raises a security request for open internet access, which means she wants completely unrestricted internet within the company. The security team approves access to Facebook and Twitter as she has valid need to know or need to access. All right. So what we see here is this marketing lady. She wants access to the entire internet and she says the reason is she wants to make some noise on Facebook about an upcoming event. So in based on the principle of need to know, the security team will give her access only to Facebook, only to Twitter. They don't give her access to the entire internet because we don't know what else it could be misused for. Not only that, they will give her access only to Facebook and Twitter. This is on the basis of the principle of least privileges. All right, so we don't give her complete Internet access, only Facebook and Twitter on the basis of least privileges. And of course, this is approved on the basis of need to know because she has a legitimate business requirement to access these websites, which is Facebook and Twitter. All right, so let's not worry about the uh, distinction between these two. We will look at it in the upcoming question as well. Separation of duties means you have the concept of maker, checker, as well as approver. Someone is raising a request, someone is reviewing it, someone else is approving it. The most common example where you'll see this is in banks. For example, you want to operate a bank locker. Um, you as the uh, customer, you will have a key to open the bank locker. But then that is not enough to open the locker. You have to get in another key as well which the key custodian for which will be the branch, the let's say the branch manager of this particular bank. Uh, and uh, this branch manager has to come with you. Both of you have to insert your keys at the same time. And only then can the locker be operated successfully. So you can ensure that you do not auth operate your locker um, without the knowledge of the bank man branch manager. The branch manager cannot take away your valuables without your knowledge. Both of you have to work together in order to operate the locker. That same concept wherein you have more than one individual who is required to successfully complete a business process is what we call separation of duties. All right. So this is a principle that is to restrict permissions, restrict misuse of privileges. You'll typically see it within banking environments, within uh, highly sensitive business processes, critical business processes across organizations. All right. So guys, I told you we will discuss need to know and principle of least privileges on the question. Take 30 seconds or maybe you'll need some more time for this question. Let's try to match the scenarios to the corresponding principle. So you need to match um, point number one to any one of these, point number two and so on. Let's take a few seconds for this.
All right, let's look at the answers. Excellent. Two, three, four, and one. Again, answers by Manish as well as uh, Amit. Four, one, two, and three. Okay, let's try to break the answers down. Thank you guys so much for your answers. Let's take a look. So the external auditor is asked to sign the NDA before being allowed into the business sensitive uh, environments. Of course, this is um, scenario number one, wherein you're asking him to sign an NDA before allowing him into your business sensitive environments. Okay. okay. I have a feeling that this would fall in under due diligence. Anyway, let's park this. You have taken up a new assignment as a salesperson. As you will be interacting with customers, you listen to the CRM. All right, so the keyword here is as you will be interacting with customers. This is a keyword here, which means we're talking about some legitimate business need. You have a legitimate need to know, which is this one right here. So as you have a legitimate business need, we will give you those accesses. As you will handle only customers in the banking sector, again, the keyword here is only, you'll be given access only to the banking model or the CRM tool. This is principle of least privileges. You have a business need to access the CRM. So this is a need to know. Since you're gonna handle only the banking customers, we will give you the basic most, most you know, fundamental privileges, which is your principle of least privileges. Last one, you have received a new PO from a customer for a new training service. Your manager approves it and loops in the finance team. So you're talking about your manager, you're talking about the finance team, and you're talking about yourself. Three individuals in order to complete the, uh, the processing of a purchase order. This reminds us of separation of duties where we said we need more than one individual or entity involved to complete a particular process. So yes, your answers are definitely correct, guys. Thank you so much for this. To repeat, NDA talks about due diligence. This is one. Need to know is the second one that you see here. Principle of least privileges is the third one, and the fourth one is over here. So two, three, four, and one, these are the answers, which is exactly what Amit had given us, and similar to what Manish had given us as well. Due diligence, again, uh, from, from Vinod, yes, so that's absolutely correct. So thank you guys for your answers. Some are perfectly right, some are almost there. Thank you so much. Let's keep going on. The next one is accountability. We just spoke about authentication. We spoke about, um, we spoke about, just a second, I'll go to the frames. Yes, we spoke about authentication. We spoke about authorization. The last one of the three, you know, AAA triad is accountability. What do I mean by accountability? Ensure that there is an undeniable link between an individual and that individual's actions. Now, when I say individuals, I'm referring to subject. And like you already saw, subjects can be not only individuals, it can be system components, network components. Enforcement of an undeniable association between every event on an object and a unique subject. Simplest way of describing it is logs. Every activity that is carried out by the subject on that object is recorded in the terms of in terms of logs. Through these logs, you are able to record, you are able to audit in future all the activities that were carried out by the subject on this particular object. All right. So based on this principle, let's look at this simple question. It talks about what goes into building a log management ecosystem, a holistic log management ecosystem. Let's take a few minutes to just read it and, um, and come out with the answers.
All right, let's look at the answers. Dynamic asset discovery, log integrity monitoring, periodic audit of time server, as well as dynamic asset discovery. Right, you guys have got the right answer, in fact, in your answers. Thank you so much, uh, Robin. Thank you so much, Manish. Ruben, as well as Manish. Thank you so much. Let's go. To, let's dig into the question. Company X has implemented a log management program. Logs are connected manually from manually configured IP addresses and centrally stored for a period of six months. An NTP time server, which is nothing but network time protocol, a time server, has been deployed to ensure accuracy of date and timestamps. What is missing and what is the significance? All right. So log review, we haven't spoken about it at all. So it's missing. Time sync is there. Log integrity monitoring. This is also not something that has been covered. Log retention is covered because you say that the logs are going to be stored for six months. This is fine. Periodic audit of the time server has not been covered as well as dynamic asset discovery has not been covered. So log review is missing. Integrity monitoring or FIM is missing. Periodic audit is missing. Dynamic asset discovery is missing. Each of these is important from a holistic log management perspective. That's the reason I built all of these into the simple question. So guys, um, if you're familiar with PCI DSS, you would have seen requirement 10 of PCI DSS. It is one of the best, in fact, the most straightforward requirements of the whole standard. And it's also one of the most demanding. Requirement 10 talks about log management. Logs are important from the perspective of accountability as well as auditability. And a holistic log management ecosystem, it will consist of all of these dimensions, not just one or two. It shouldn't be uh, you know, um, a half-baked solution for log management. So first of all, you should ensure that logs are collected from all the critical systems in, the, in your ecosystem, not just uh, you know, one or two servers or one or two firewalls. All critical systems, including security components, firewalls, IDS, IPSs, uh, web app firewalls, and so on. All of these have to be in scope for your log management ecosystem. Secondly, these logs should be consolidated. They should be collected and stored in a central, um, you know, log server, syslog, or even integrated into your SIM solution. And these should be reviewed on an ongoing basis. Because what's the point of collecting logs if they are, you're not going to read them and find out when something is, you know, when there's an indicator of compromise in these logs. So log review is important. Logs should be retained for a sufficient period of time. What do I mean by sufficient period of time? Really depends on your business needs. Well, PCI tells you you need to hold on to your logs for one year, which is a very, very long time. Uh, most organizations, they stop with a maximum of six months. Uh, of course, not the PCI compliant ones, but most other companies, they go with a, a timeline of six months because beyond this, it's too expensive to retain logs. Um, why do you need to retain them? Because m many cyber attacks you would have seen, they are not discovered for months. You know, it takes sometimes even years before a cyber attack is discovered. Um, when you discover these attacks, your first point of reference is your logs because logs give you some sort of indicators on what went wrong and how did the attackers get inside. So if you don't have these logs for at least six months or even one year from a PCI perspective, um, the whole purpose is not going to be achieved. So ensure that you have those logs being retained for six months or one year, depending on your business needs. Ensure that your timestamps are accurate on your log because logs will consist of the uh, the systems that were impacted, the subject, the object, for example. What is the kind of activity the subject logged in to this object uh, into a particular system? Um, the login was successful or it failed. All of this would be included in the log. Also, the date and timestamp is of utmost importance because if it is wrong, then it's just not going to help you in your investigation. So ensure that the, the um, logs, the whole ecosystem is audited from all of these perspectives. Timestamps are accurate and are updated as well at all points of time. Dynamic discovery of assets. Now, a lot of SIM solutions, they, auto, they have this feature wherein every, any time a new IP address is introduced into your, into your network, it is automatically uh, you know, scoped in as part of your, your SIM monitoring, which means logs are also being collected from this particular new IP address. So dynamic discovery of assets, especially for large organizations, is a very, very must-have feature. All right. So guys, this brings us to the close of, um, of access management. Uh, it's almost 12, and uh, we are jumping now into the next module, which is risk. Let's take a short break of about uh, 10 minutes and uh, we'll continue. We've completed this much. We are going to start with risk management after this. We'll continue in about 10 minutes. I hope that is okay with you. 
Um, and um, if it's not, let me know about your, your your feedback, your comments and so on, how you feel about the whole training so far. Please type it into the chat window. We're more than happy to take it forward from there. So is, uh, is 10 minutes OK for the break? All right, all right, all right. All right, guys, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. All right, so uh, we need a prior break and uh, 15 minutes as well. I, I think I would uh, agree with you. Let's make it a 15 minute break. Let's make it 15 minutes and uh, finish the prayers as well. Hopefully, and we'll uh, resume in 15 minutes. All right, guys, thank you so much. Thank you so much.
Very warm welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for uh, staying with us. Uh, we've just completed half of the training today in terms of timelines, not, not in terms of slides. We still have quite some ground to cover. Uh, for those who have joined in late, uh, thank you so much for coming in. My name is Praveen Joseph. I'm the uh, lead trainer for today's session, uh, Cybersecurity Fundamentals by Ingram Micro Cybersecurity. Uh, so guys, we will resume now after the break. We just took a 15 minute break and I do wish I could give you more time, but I'm, I'm really sorry we have to start because we have uh, we are limited in terms of overall time. It's just a four hour training. Normally, this is the material that would uh, you know span out across an entire day, um, but we are summarizing it into um, the short version today. In four hours, wherein we'll try to cover as much ground as possible from the cybersecurity uh, fundamentals perspective. All right, so let's resume the slides. Um, um, we have we have more than 50 people in this particular room, uh, 37 and counting right now, I see, but we had 58 plus the, just a few minutes back. Um, very, very uh, happy to have a cross-functional group of experts, people from multiple sectors of industry. So um, your your contribution is very, very valuable in terms of your questions, comments, feedback, opinions, anything at any point of time. Please share them and we uh, welcome them. We'll take them at periodic points, as you've seen. We're taking your points and your comments as well uh, and questions, just having them addressed as and when they come up. All right, without further ado, we are jumping into the next section, which is risk. Just to summarize, we understood what is cybersecurity. We looked at how cybersecurity is different from information security and privacy. Then we looked at um, some different you know, factors influencing cybersecurity in the region. We looked at some cyber attacks. We looked at British Airways, Cambridge Analytica, um, and so on. We also looked at the dark web. Uh, we understood from a technical perspective how it is different from the rest of the regular web, so-called surface web and deep web, so to speak. And then we started studying about some basic concepts of cybersecurity or information security more specifically, which is access control management. We just completed the three A's, the triple A principles of access control management, authentication, authorization, as well as accountability. And now we're going to look at risk. Why risk specifically, you can ask me. There is what really is risk. We need to understand this first of all. And like you can see, risk is a part of everyday life. And we as human beings, we have learned to anticipate risk, to um, manage it on an ongoing basis and still get along with our lives and you know carry on with our day-to-day -day activities and still achieving intended objectives. The same concepts of risk, when you extrapolate them to uh, the perspective of information, information security or cyber security, it is in fact fundamental to the way in which organizations have to approach their security strategies itself. So let me give you a simple example. What do I mean by this? Um, we spoke briefly about standards, security standards like PCI DSS. We also mentioned very briefly ISO 27001 earlier today. And even, uh, you know, regulations like, for example, GDPR, which talk about privacy. Now, all of these standards, regulations, frameworks, etc., they tell you what is expected in terms of security best practices, they give you a baseline for security, uh, you know, or benchmark for security implementation within your organization. Now, how do you know that what these standards recommend? How do you know that they are actually appropriate for your organization? For example, uh, PCI DSS tells you that you need to have, uh, you know, a password strength of seven characters, for example, uh, for all the passwords for all the users in your environment. Do you think that seven is sufficient enough? Maybe you need a 10 character password because your your information security ecosystem mandates this. Right. How do you make this call? How do you make the get the information about this? This is where you need to. This is where you need to. Um, this is where you need to understand the concept of risk. I do apologize, guys. I forgot to share my screen. Thank you for uh, calling it out. Uh, Vijay Arputraj, thank you so much for telling me and uh, Mohsen Hamza as well. And Ruben, guys, I do apologize. I forgot to share my screen uh, when I came back. So um, I hope you can see it now. Um, just pulling up the concept of risk. Uh, this is the one slide which was before this, wherein I was explaining to you the context of risk assessment itself, the, the concept of risk itself, and how we have, as individuals, we've learned to accept and manage risk, still carry on with our day-to-day -day activities. The same concept when you extrapolate it to an information security perspective. How do you ensure how do you ensure that you have taken into consideration how much security is enough security for your company? The answer lies in risk. 
simple example, PCI DSS tells you your passwords should have, um, you know, seven characters, alphanumeric and so on and so forth. Is that enough for your organization? You need to understand the risk posture of your company. And how do you do this? You need to break down the risk components for your organization. What are these components? Asset, threat, impact, and vulnerability. All right. Quickly confirming that you can see my screen. I hope you can see my screen, guys. Sir, I can't chat. Please enable my, you know. OK, all right. Let me check uh, what's happened with the chat settings. Just bear with those guys. Give me a second. My name is Amit Kumar and I am unable to chat. Uh, OK. All right, thank you for confirming you can see my screen. Uh, Amit, I'm not really sure why you're not able to chat. Uh, I need to investigate this. I just changed your role to attendee. I mean, maybe you can chat now. Just just check. All right. Um, oh, sorry for interrupting again. Uh, still same issue. OK, never mind, Amit. So um, if uh, if you're facing the issue, what I'll request is uh, unmute yourself when when you have the you know, when you want to chat, when you want to tell us something and uh, we can you can definitely speak. I don't think others are facing the issue uh, or maybe like Mohsen is suggesting, maybe you can try to rejoin the meeting. But if not, I will I will just request you to just unmute yourself and you know speak uh, at any point of time. No, not a problem at all. All right. So let's, uh, let's carry on. Let's move forward. Um, all right, so we're trying to understand the concept of risk itself and uh, risk has some founding components or founding elements, which are the ones that I've highlighted over here, namely asset, threat, impact, as well as vulnerability. Again, why is it that risk is important from a cybersecurity perspective? When you look at security standards, when you look at benchmarks, re regulations, laws, and so on, they will tell you what is a minimum baseline of security. But it is you who have to decide how much security is enough security for your organization. The way to answer that is by considering the concept of risk. How do you understand risk? How do you extrapolate? How do you measure it? How do you manage it and so on? This is what we're quickly going to try to understand. Risk is, that, well, there are a lot of definitions for us, multiple definitions for risk. From an information security perspective, we try to say that risk is a possibility or probability that a weakness or a vulnerability in your asset is exploited by the threat leading to negative impact, right? So there is a weakness in an asset. This asset has specific value. A threat comes in, it exploits this and causes a negative impact or undesired negative impact on your organization. This is the concept of definition of risk. There are multiple definitions, but when you when you analyze them, you'll see that the common elements across them are threat, the frequency of or the likelihood of occurrence of this threat or the probability of the threat, and then impact. All right. So these are the most common elements that you will see. You can break them down into assets, vulnerabilities, threats, and so on and so forth. So how do you go about measuring this risk? How do you manage this risk? This is the whole process of risk assessment. In risk assessment, your objective is for your organization's environment, understand what are the assets, what are the value of these assets to your organizations, what are the vulnerabilities present in these assets, and what threats can exploit these vulnerabilities. From these entities, you can find out what is the impact and from that you will measure the risk score and accordingly you can decide what is your risk response, right? So how, let's go through each of these phases very, very quickly. Scope is the first phase wherein you define what is the boundaries of your risk assessment. So maybe I want to do a risk assessment for a physical entity, which is for, for a building, for a, da for a data center, or maybe for the entire city itself from a business continuity perspective. 
or maybe I'm doing risk assessment for a team, a specific team like my sales team, my HR team, or a business process, the process of you know online payment in a, in a retail store or so on, or for an application, I'm doing a risk assessment for, an, for a core banking application in the bank. The reason I need to define the scope is to understand what, where is the boundary, where is the you know logical or the physical boundaries of my analysis of my assessment itself, and what are the players inside this boundary as well as outside of this boundary. This is what I'll need to understand as part of assets, threats, vulnerabilities, and so on. This brings me to the next level, which is assets. In assets, the typical textbook definition is anything of value to the organization. And from an information security perspective, we are focused only on information assets, right? So assets can be of different types. They can be primary assets, such as information, um, you know, sensitive information or so on. Or they can be supporting assets like your IT uh, infrastructure, your servers, firewalls, networks, um, USB sticks, and so on, databases. It can be a person, it can be a building, and so on. All right. You can have asset owners, you can have asset custodians as well. Asset owners, they are the guys who are accountable for uh, you know the uh, security of the asset. They are the guys who define the security requirements of the asset. Asset custodian is the guy who is working with this asset on a day-to-day -day basis. Simple example, the CIO, the CTO, or the head of IT, these guys are the asset owners of your organization's laptops, servers, network devices, and so on. But the network administrator, the firewall administrator, these guys are the custodians of the firewalls. They are not the owners specifically of the firewalls. They are required to implement the security rules as defined by the asset owners as and enforced it. Similarly, the laptops that your company has provided you with, especially now that we're in a working from home scenario, um, you and me, we are custodians of these laptops. The IT head or the IT department or so on, they are the owners. We are required to follow the security principles, the configurations that have been defined by the company's policies for these laptops. All right, so that's a broad definition of the distinction between owners and custodians. And of course, asset value. There are multiple ways of measuring the asset value. What is the value of this asset to the competition? How much downtime will the organization face if this asset is compromised? How much dollars? What is the dollar value of investment that we have to put into the development of this asset? Multiple factors will go into the determination of the asset value for the um, uh, for the specific asset. Next up, we will determine what are the threats, all right? And we'll try to break down the parameters of the threat. What is a threat actor, threat motive, threat channel, likelihood of occurrence or probability of occurrence and so on. All right, threat is a negative entity who can exploit weaknesses in the asset and thereby cause a negative impact or an outcome. Different types of threat actors, you can have uh, human insiders, human outsiders, external or internal um, individuals, internal as in even employees, because they knowingly or unknowingly they click on a phishing link or they introduce malware into the organization like we saw in the case of Aramco. Uh, you can have environmental factors like humidity, fire, flood, and so on. All of these can um, can also be you know, acts of God, like how COVID-19 is affecting business uh, right now. These are where uh, threat actors could be uh, beyond the control of the organization, force majeure, to put it lightly. Uh, threat motive may be intentional, maybe accidental. It's important to understand this because intentional means you are probably um, being targeted by an attacker and you need to have stricter controls. Accidental threats are those caused because employees are not aware of something or it is just an honest mistake. So they're not probably as critical as your intentional attacks. Uh, threat channel can be network, it can be physical, of course. Um, um, Network-based attacks like, for example, DDoS attacks, ransomware and so on, or physical attacks involve physical theft, physical damage to your infrastructure, physically um, exploiting individuals, uh, social engineering and so on, or, or impersonation of employees and so on. All right. Likelihood of occurrence is a probability that a threat will occur. Of course, it is, um, it is only an estimation. It is not something that is 100% accurate and can be estimated using different methods, qualitative, quantitative, using probability, or based on experience of similar threats faced by uh, the competing organizations in the same sector, or then similar threats faced by the organization itself within the last five to 10 years or so on. All right, so multiple factors come into play. The next one is vulnerability, which is the absence of a control or the weakness of a control. What is a control? A control is a countermeasure which is implemented in order to uh, in order to negate or um, mitigate the impact of a threat on an asset. Simple example, um, 
well, I have a laptop that I give to my employees and I have controls such as DLP, antivirus, uh, USB blocking and all of this which is installed on this laptop. Uh, it can go to the extent of even extremely intrusive, invasive controls like keyboard uh, key loggers which can track all the uh, uh, keystrokes made by the employees, traffic monitoring uh, applications as well which will monitor every single website the, that the employee visits and so on. So different kinds of controls that you can have in order to mitigate the negative impact of a threat. Uh, when such a control is not present or it is present but it is not working well, you have something called a vulnerability. So you try to quantify the vulnerability in terms of how serious it is, what is the level of this vulnerability, what is the magnitude of this vulnerability, and you can quantify it as um, uh, uh, using quantitative or qualitative methods, of course, uh, as high, medium, or low. Once you have all of these players, you can calculate the risk using many formulas. The most common one is likelihood of threat, level of vulnerability, value of the asset. Take all of these metrics together, you uh, mix and match them, whatever you know, proprietary formula you prefer, and then you come out with a risk rating, right? Once you have a risk score, guys, you have different ways in which you can respond to the risk, which is mitigate, transfer, avoid, or accept. This is very important. Um, the four options. If you have a very very low risk, uh, you know, which is coming out as an outcome of your risk uh, assessment. Maybe it's not, um, you know, it's not a wise decision to go ahead and start investing and mitigating this risk because it's a low risk. The risk of um, earthquake in Dubai, for example, is low. So we're not going to spend millions of dirhams on earthquake proofing our skyscrapers here. So whereas this is in contrast with Japan, where uh, the majority of skyscrapers that you see in Japan are already, you know, earthquake proofed. It is an inherent part of the building design itself because the risk is significantly high. Right. So for low risks, um, risks which fall be below a predefined threshold value, which is called the risk acceptance criterion, we will accept the risk. Right. So it's very low. I'm not going to spend uh, any additional dollars on managing this risk. Another option for me is to avoid the entire risk causing activity altogether. Simple example, um, I don't want my employees to work from home because I think the risk is too high. Of course, this is not an option in today's uh, COVID-19 situation, but uh, in the pre-COVID-19 pre days, I would say, critical, um, uh, you know, comp critical operations in involving, for example, uh, banking processes, uh, data centers, and so on, employees will mandatorily have to come to the office and connect to the systems in order to work, because the, the organization feels it's too risky to let them connect remotely, even though there are business benefits. Uh, we don't let them connect remotely and therefore work from home is not an option at all that is given to employees, uh, at least in the pre-COVID-19 days. Um, another example is remote connections to, um, uh, to critical applications are not permitted under any circumstance. Uh, we don't authorize any sort of third party connections, remote connections, only employees, legitimate insiders are allowed to connect to some critical systems. All right. Um, the next option is to jump in for transferring the risk to a third party. When I say third party, I will either purchase cyber insurance or I will outsource the business process to a third party because they can handle the risk a lot better than me. All right. So if I feel that my organization is not well equipped to handle the risk involved in a particular business process, I can simply go ahead and engage in the risky activity, just purchase some insurance in case something goes wrong or get breached. Uh, I can make a claim and uh, it should get honored by the cyber insurance providing company. Or the next option is I just outsource the entire business process to the so-called experts, maybe um, because they are better equipped at handling this risk. I just engage them as an outsourced service provider and they will um, handle the entire activity on my behalf. Right. So roles and responsibilities, lines of accountability have to be drawn out through the MSA, the uh, master service agreement that is drawn out between the service provider as well as the controlling company itself. All right. So these are the three options for handling risks. The fourth one is the most common wherein I try to mitigate the risk by applying appropriate controls. What I do here is the risk level is high. I will identify the most suitable controls to reduce the risk and bring it to an acceptable level, which is the one that you see over here. I need to reduce the risk level to such a to such a level that it is acceptable to carry on with the business because I have applied mitigating controls. 
I have I'm storing a lot of um, uh, you know sensitive information pertaining to my customers on a database. Um, it is not even encrypted. The risk level is high. So what are the um, mitigating controls that I can have over here? Well, I can ensure that <clears throat> access is avail available only to legitimate users. Remote access is not uh, permitted under any scenarios. Uh, I will do everything I can to make sure that no copies are made of the database under any circumstances. So data cannot be copied onto external storage devices and so on. And it is at all times available only through the database and can be accessed only through only by legitimate users. But these are some ways through which I will try to mitigate the risk of data not being encrypted in the database. Or a lot of vast majority of banks, by the way, they do not encrypt um, customer records in their core banking application databases because it involves a lot of downtime for every single transaction to decrypt and then again encrypt records and so on. So for the purpose of ease of operation for keeping things simple, they just store records in uh, clear text. They do not encrypt them under any circumstances, just so that um, the speed of transactions are not is not affected under any circumstances. What they do is they go ahead and apply mitigating controls to protect the risk involved in, uh, you know, storing, for example, your card number in clear text, your 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 16-digit banking card number, your credit card number, or debit card number. They apply mitigating controls similar to the ones that I just told you about. They do not allow any copying of the data. They do not allow any unauthorized individuals to access it. Only one or two individuals like the DBAs can actually access these databases. And all transactions involving these records on the databases will act, will occur only through defined stored procedures through automated mechanisms. There can be no manual, uh, you know, custom developed stored procedures which DBAs can develop to pull out the data, to query the data and so on. So there's a governance around the way in which this data can be accessed and used. All right, so these are some of the controls that banks have. You will see these and probably you know these as well, especially those of us here who are from the banking sector. All right, so guys, here's a quick question for you from what we've discussed. Hospital X uses a cloud-based hospital management system, HMS. This HMS automates all the hospital operations such as patient appointment booking, pharmacy inventory management, archiving, etc., etc. What is the most critical primary asset in an enterprise-wide information security risk assessment, which is ISRI? What is the most important primary asset? Very simple question. Let's take 30 seconds to uh, break this down. According to me, the second option is patient health report. All right. All right, Amit. Thank you so much. I think you've got the right answer. And uh, any other? Yes, Manish and uh, Mohsen Iqbal as well. Thank you so much. So the correct answer is the second option, patient health records. How do you break this answer down? We have to go back to the slide where we spoke about assets. We spoke about different types of assets. Okay, this one specific section here. Primary assets such as sensitive information and supporting assets can be your servers, uh, IT infrastructure, people, buildings, and so on. Uh, I see that I've, I've removed the word here. It was supposed to be buildings over here. It's not uh, here for an error. I do apologize. Um, but yes, the primary asset pertains to your sensitive information. Where is this definition coming from? Just to add, it comes from ISO 27005 risk assessment uh, methodology, wherein assets are classified as primary assets and supporting assets. So primary asset is your most important information asset, which is in this case patient health records. You will see this from a HIPAA um, information security risk assessment perspective. All right, the next question is an outsourced application support engineer contracted by the cloud service provider. We are still on the same case of, of the hospital. So an outsourced person accidentally deleted 1.3 terabytes of patient records. This affects the hospital operations for a whole week. Match the following. Let's take one minute for this.
All right, guys, let's see the answers. Uh, no answers yet. All right, so in the interest of time, let's break this down. Threat actor is the outsourced application support engineer. So it's a human insider that you see over here. Threat motive, it was accidental, as we mentioned earlier. Threat channel, it was network based because she had there was no physical destruction of any data. There was no um, physical harm or damage to any data assets. It was a network based deletion of data, 1.3 terabytes. Impact was, of course, non availability for a whole week, which is seven days, non availability 1.3 TB of critical data for a whole week of seven, which is seven days, right? So, very straightforward and simple question. We'll move straight now into the next section, which is passwords. Now, just, just to see uh, where we are in the grand scheme of things, guys. So we've completed sections one and two, where we looked at the definition of cybersecurity. We looked at the fundamentals, uh, basic concepts of uh, access control management, and then we looked at risk as well very briefly right now. What we're going to do now is we we'll look at basics of cybersecurity personal hygiene. Now, this is a very simple, quick section where we talk about passwords, endpoint security, and DLP. After that, we'll spend some time on what the attackers use as their common avenues for destruction, which is social engineering, social media security, and then ransomware. All right. So um, I, I believe we should be able to complete these two within um, uh, within less than an hour max, and then we will quickly jump into physical security, incident management, and lastly, the challenges for today. We should be on time to finish by two o'clock, I believe, and uh, will pace myself accordingly. Just a quick reminder again, guys, I can't uh, stop repeating this. Please, please, please keep your chats and questions coming in at any point of time. Uh, it's very important for us that you are able to interact and we are able to take your messages. Uh, Amit has also sent me a screenshot I just saw where he's uh, not able to uh, chat. I don't I don't know why this is the case, Amit. I'm not disabled chat for anybody. Uh, so please use the chat window. If you're not able to, like like Amit can already has already been doing, just unmute yourself and uh, we can you know interact verbally as well, absolutely. All right, so let's get back to the slides. We are now jumping straight into cybersecurity personal hygiene, where we talk about what you and me as in, as employees of an organization, what are the basic principles of cybersecurity that we need to follow in order to ensure we are not the point of entry for a cyber criminal to access our organizational assets. We'll start with passwords, the most fu fundamental component of uh, access control, the fu most fundamental component of security. Um, this might be news to you, but the four most the four most common passwords that have been seen in the world are the ones that you see over here, one, two, three, password, and so on. People tend to miss miss um, misunderstand the importance of a strong password in their organizational ecosystems. Um, of course, nowadays systems they mandate passwords complexities, and um, these are what you see in terms of password policies: length, complexity, lifetime history, and so on. But but when you are defining your password, when you're defining the, the difficulty level of your password, it is always advisable to refer to a simple password selection guide. You can make the password so complex that it is difficult for an outsider to guess the password. But what you'll do here is you'll also make it difficult for users to remember the password. So I can say your password has to have, uh, you know, uh, 15 characters and uh, password lifetime of 15 again. Uh, you need to have five uh, uppercase, 10 lowercase, and so on and so forth. It can be so complex that people don't want to end up remembering this. This is one extreme. The other extreme is where your password is so easy that it is uh, easy to guess and it is easy to remember as well. Your password could be the same as your username, to say, for, for example. That is the easiest scenario that it's possible. All right. So ideally, you should avoid number four as well as number three over here. What you should do is you should strive to be in this one particular uh, quadrant, which is difficult to guess and still easy for the users to remember because you don't want them to end up forgetting the passwords and trying to, you know, reset the password every time or uh, writing the password down, which is a worst case scenario. So it should be difficult to guess, fairly strong, fairly um, uh, difficult to crack. But at the same time, it should be easier for the users to remember their passwords. There are different ways in which passwords can be cracked by attackers to compromise your network, guys. Um, we'll briefly look at these. The first one is electronic monitoring, mm -hmm. wherein the attacker will listen, sorry, will listen to network traffic 
try to siphon out any information pertaining to authentication credentials if the protocol that is being used by the users does not encrypt the passwords you're using a clear text protocol for authentication like for example telnet telnet does not in any way encrypt your passwords then the attacker they have access to your clear text usernames and passwords all right so you, this is this is why it is always important that passwords are always encrypted another possibility is what we call the replay attack in a replay attack the attacker has access to the encrypted password and can still authenticate himself to an aut authentication server by simply replaying the process of authentication with the encrypted password itself. He doesn't even need to have access to the decrypted password. He just replays the steps for authentication using the encrypted password itself. And uh, if he's able to successfully get through, he, we have a case of a successful replay attack that has happened over here. Another possibility is the attacker has access to the password file. Normally in authentication servers, whether it's Radius, whether it is Takax or Kerberos or so on, multiple authentication technologies are there. If the attacker has access to this authentication server and he's able to get access to the file where users' passwords are stored, then you know for a fact that, that this is more than enough to compromise the user accounts of these individuals. It came to light recently that for a very, very long time, Facebook was not encrypting or hashing users' passwords. So your username and password for a very long time was being stored in clear text by Facebook in their authentication servers. So what this meant is if someone had access, illegal access, of course, to these servers, um, they had access to your usernames and passwords. It was all that was needed to compromise your accounts. Uh, it was only fairly recently that Facebook took the step of hashing the passwords and you know applying salt and so on to them. The other possibility is brute force attack, wherein the attacker tries to cycle through number of permutations, number of combinations before he or she is able to guess what is the correct password. If your password is complex, if it is randomly generated, and if it is involving a sufficient number of you know um, alphabets, special characters, and numbers, and so on, it will become more difficult to crack your passwords. Of course, password complexity along with limited number of invalid login attempts this is the best way to protect yourself from brute, from brute force attacks. In a brute force attack, the attacker is by default, sorry, the attacker is by brute force trying to break into the application by guessing your password. This is why critical applications like your online banking application, for instance, they limit the number of invalid tries that you can have to log in. If you enter the wrong password thrice or four times, you're locked out for the rest of the day, just in order to make it difficult for attackers who are trying to guess your password. Last one, of course, is social engineering, wherein the attacker falsely claims that he has a necessary authorization to access specific resources. In social engineering, we will see this in one of the upcoming sections. The attacker tries to manipulate their victims using tricks, using um, fool, you know, methods to deceive them, deception rather, and tries to fool them into giving out information, including, for instance, their passports. This will help them to carry out, uh, you know, whatever attacks that they want, because they now have complete access to confidential information, like, for example, your passwords. We'll talk about social engineering in detail, guys, in one of the upcoming sections. Simple question for you. In fact, two questions here on this slide. A software project manager has billed five members of his team to a client. Two unbuilt members are now added later in order to meet the fast approaching deadline. They are instructed to share the passwords, usernames and passwords of the existing guys in order to avoid any questions. So of course this is wrong, wherein, um, and this is a typical scenario where you have, uh, you know, unbuilt members, um, what we call buffer resources who are added to a project and they don't have um, authorized credentials, rather they just reuse the approved credentials given to team members. It's not right, of course, but what are the negative impacts of this approach? What do you think is a better solution? This is question number one. A wisher calls you claiming to be from your company's IT and he asks for your company email ID and password. Of course, this is social engineering. But the question is, how well are we able to recognize that this is social engineering? How well are we able to stop this person and still Ensure that it's not um, that if it is a genuine request, it's not uh, you know completely knocked out of the park. 
how do you take a balanced approach? What are the risks? Think about these two questions, guys. Let's take about 60 seconds for this. All right, guys, in the interest of time. All right, guys, in the interest of time, we'll move on. So the software project manager has built five members of the team to the client, and then he adds two unbuilt members, all right? So um, this is a typical scenario, like we said, and of course it's not a wise approach to take where you're sharing usernames and passwords um, across your team members. Uh, the risks are huge in terms, of, in terms of accountability. If you recall, we spoke about the principle of accountability earlier today, wherein we said, you need to have an undeniable association between a subject's identity and the subject's actions on an object. The subject's identity is now compromised because you don't know who is actually using a user ID 1, 2, 3. It might be team member A, it might be team member B. So the principle of accountability goes for a toss when you have users sharing usernames and passwords. What is a better solution from a security perspective? Of course, you need to come clean to your end customer and tell them, guys, we have two additional resources. If not, we're not going to be able to meet the deadline. Of course, from a business perspective, it is not the best approach because the client is not going to be happy. Um, we can look at the option of telling the client that there is no additional charges for these two new members and you're going to be using them uh, just to make sure that the, the deadline is met. The second question is a wisher calls you claiming to be from your company's IT support team and he asks for your company email ID and password. Most likely to be um, um, a social engineering call, of course, but just in order to ensure that you don't rule out the possibility that it's a genuine call from your organization, 
tell them you're not going to give him any confidential information, emails and passwords and so on. If he's from the company IT, uh, he needs to send you an email or he can give you his email ID and you can send him an email later on after you verify the email ID, of course, with your corporate networks. Just buy some time. Uh, try to draw the balance in the, uh, you know, try to draw the midpoint or a midline. Make sure that you do not under any circumstances reveal any information pertaining to the company. So we have some beautiful answers as well from Manish, misuse of confidential integrity, credential sharing and violation. Of course, yes, this is for question number one. Uh, and again from Zishan Ali, they can misuse the credentials. Absolutely correct. Uh, again, Manish has mentioned in for question number two that companies and secret can be exposed. Access to companies information is uh, now available to potential attackers from the outside world. Absolutely right. Thank you guys so much for your feedback. These are very, very valid points. Uh, and I hope that they are able to get us to think uh, in terms of how to approach when we are targeted by a social engineering call. Now, just, just a side note, guys, the slides here, when you read these questions and, uh, you know, we are now in the context of a security centric world because we've been talking since 10 a.m. as of this morning. So the last three hours we've been talking about cyber security and we are in that specific mindset. One week from now, one month from now, if you are receiving a call from a so-called social engineer, from a wisher, for example, VISHER, um, security would not really be the most important thing on our mind. We would probably be nervous, especially now given the COVID-19 situation. We are working from home. Every, every part of business is now conducted remotely. So we would, I would say nine out of 10 times, we would, we would not suspect that this is a social engineering call. What is important is for us to get into that specific mindset. You and me as individuals, let's get into that mindset and always, always proceed with caution. When you are in doubt, and I hope you will be in doubt, never ever give out any information, right? You need to draw that mid midline or that middle line rather and tell them, um, I, I do believe you, but I just need to verify who you claim to be. So um, why don't you just give me a call or uh, you know have your manager call me or send me an email through another methodology where I can verify your, your identity. Under no circumstances should you concede to their demands on the very first call or even through follow up calls. By the way, a lot of these calls do happen, especially here in the Middle East region. You, you've definitely received a lot of these calls on your on your on your telephone, on your mobile phones. All right. So guys, jumping on to the next section, which is endpoints. What really are endpoints? Any device which is used by your everyday employees, not the admin users, rather the general users. They can have endpoint devices such as laptops, mobile phones, uh, desktops, and so on. These devices are the largest in terms of number when you talk about your IT ecosystems, and therefore they also represent the largest exposure point for your organization's IT ecosystem when you speak from a cybersecurity perspective. In order to have them secured holistically, you should have multiple dimensions which talk about entire, uh, you know, holistic lifecycle governance, anti-malware management, patch management, access control and management, and of course, physical security of your endpoint devices itself. What do I mean by each, by each of these? Lifecycle governance means a secure mechanism, a holistic and formal mechanism for allocating and deallocating the assets, laptops basically, having an updated inventory of your endpoints, hardening the devices in line with your baseline security standards, allocation and deallocation, we just spoke about this, and then monthly audit. Right, so what this means is, in your organization, you should have IT essentially, you should have an inventory of all the endpoint devices, uh, identified normally by their host names, MAC addresses, something like this, which uniquely tracks them. Every time someone joins a company, you should have a mechanism to push the latest image of your operating system on this desktop or laptop. And then you allocate it to this employee, you update the inventory which says the asset owner is now, uh, sorry, the asset custodian is now employee 123 who has just joined us on this date and it has been handed over to him or to her. We also have to make sure that every month we check the basic security compliance of this particular device, which means patches are updated, uh, USB is blocked, uh, antivirus is functioning, and so on and so forth. The monthly compliance check should be carrying out or carried out on the devices. Once the laptop is, um, uh, once the employee is leaving the company and the laptop has to be allocated to somebody else, make sure that all the data has been removed from this laptop before it is given to a new employee. When I say remove, you can either delete it holistically or you can take a backup and store it into a central repository because you need it from a business continuity perspective. 
but make sure it doesn't go into the other into the hands of the other employee who is now going to use this laptop or if you're going to dispose of the laptop altogether make sure that the whole data is holistically deleted when i say deleted there are multiple ways of deletion i'm not talking about shift delete i'm talking about other more secure deletion mechanisms like clearing purging formatting uh, multiple times and you can also go to the extent of degaussing or physical destruction of the hard disk itself when i say degaussing you take that hard disk and you subject it to a strong magnetic field which means the 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 hard disk itself will be rendered unreadable unusable under any circumstances or you can go to the extent of physically destroying which means you take a hammer or something like this and you physically destroy the hard disk there's no way of retrieving the data that is stored on the hard disk these are the more extreme mechanisms because it calls for 100% security but the downside is that your hard disk is no longer usable it's not reusable for less extreme um, environments you can go for you know measures like a uh, clearing and purging and so on which will where, wherein you force you forcefully insert multiple ones and zeros in the hard disk thereby reading the rendering the original data irretrievable the advantage is of course you can reuse the hard disk it's just that the data the possibility of retrieving the data is very 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 minuscule it's not 0% i will say it is very 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 small all right so that's about data uh, deletion at the end of um, the life life cycle of the organ of the endpoints the other side is about anti malware management which means you need to have technical controls as well as administrative controls i do apologize for this uh, poorly uh, poorly formatted slide it's not showing up well in the in the full screen i'll just go back to uh, to the normal view so you can see it better I do apologize. So we're back now. Um, Anti-malware management calls for technical controls as well as administrative controls. Technical controls, of course, you need to have antivirus, which is installed on all endpoint devices, and users should not have the privilege to disable the antivirus. All right, users should not be able to disable the antivirus. Um, updated signature files, periodic scans, and so on and so forth. Administrative controls, they call for a procedure to audit all your endpoints to make sure all of them have updated signatures ensure that our antivirus compliance is checked across all endpoint devices on a monthly or bi-monthly basis if something goes wrong like a virus has been detected on your on your endpoints you have a mechanism to isolate these these machines the infected machines and limit the spread of this particular incident or of this particular malware across the network itself the right word here would be quarantine, of course, which is a phrase which all of us are all too familiar with today in the COVID-19 situation. All right. The next endpoint control that you need to have is patch management. What is a patch? Every time a vendor develops an application or a software on an operating system and they release it to the outside world, we know for a fact that there is a, a risk that it is not 100% secure. There would be loopholes, there would be vulnerabilities inherent within the application itself. The vendor, like for example, Microsoft, they periodically release updates or patches in order to cover newly discovered vulnerabilities, newly discovered issues. And these issues may be from a security perspective or even from a functionality perspective. Organizations should have a mechanism to identify these patches, like you see over here, prioritize them, define a rollback mechanism, I'll come back to this, test them and then deploy them on all applicable endpoint devices. This is to ensure that your endpoints are updated at all points of time. Any known issues have been addressed by these patches, right? So before you do this, you need to identify what are the patches and prioritize them. In fact, Microsoft, every second Tuesday of the month, they roll out these uh, patch, they call the patch Tuesdays and they roll out all the uh, patches applicable for that specific month. Applicable patches for your operating systems, for your environments, you need to identify them, you need to prioritize them. You need to define a rollback mechanism. What do I mean by rollback mechanism? What happens if after deploying the patches, your functionality is impacted, your organizational, the servers are not working as intended, applications are exhibiting uh, strange behavior, for example. You need to have a mechanism to undo what you did when you installed the patches, which means you need to have a mechanism to uninstall these patches. This is what we call rollback mechanism. Now, there are different schools of thought which describe when this rollback mechanism has to be defined. Maybe it should be defined before the testing, after the testing, before um, the deployment itself, before the prioritization. 
where it fits in this workflow, it's it's not something which I would say is set in stone. It depends case by case on the organization itself. So it's up to you to decide when you're going to define your rollback mechanism. After this, you go ahead and test the patches on a live, uh, uh, sorry, on a test bed, and then you start pushing them onto the live environment itself. All right. So the last domain of endpoint security is about is physical security. Guys, especially in the UK, I've seen a lot of cases in the UK where uh, government employees have gone up, have you know, they've forgotten a laptop which contained confidential records, n million confidential records. This laptop was not password protected. It was lost. They've forgotten it at an airport. They they left it in a taxi. It's been stolen. I've seen a lot of these cases in the UK. In fact, there's one one case uh, which uh, which I always like to cite. Um, happened, I think, about three years back, three to four years back, um, just outside Heathrow Airport, where someone found a USB stick lying on the street and he picked it up mm -hmm. and he went home thinking he found a USB stick somewhere near Heathrow Airport, right? Uh, a couple of days later, he plugged it into his laptop and he was appalled because he found that it had um, the entire floor plan of the airport. Not only that, it also had information about the security protocols, operational procedures of the security team in the airport, plus it also had uh, details about a secret tunnel that is used by the Queen herself. If she happens to be in the airport and there is a terrorist, terrorist strike on the airport, this is a tunnel to be used by the Queen um, for her safety. All of this, this, these pieces of information was available on this particular USB stick. Physical security of the simple USB device was compromised. Uh, we don't know how it came out. Maybe it was an employee of the airport who lost it, or maybe it was a cyber criminal who already had access to it and they left it deliberately on the street. I don't know. It's not come out to light, guys, but physical security seeks to address these very realms of cyber security itself. We have a section where we'll talk about physical security briefly. From a from an endpoint device perspective, lock your laptops when you're not when you're not at seat. Use cable locks, which means you tag you tie your laptops using um, uh, cable locks to your to devices such as your to things like your tables, for example, so people cannot steal your laptops. Um, encrypt the uh, hard drive so that even if the laptop is stolen, the data is not really stolen. Install uh, remote wiping software as applicable, so if your laptop is stolen, you can format it even remotely. Definitely applicable for company or corporate mobile devices that you use. Uh, if the company is allowing BYOD, bring your own device. Policies should be defined when addressing the theft loss of the employee laptops, which can contain company sensor information. Right. So, so guys, multiple domains, none of these are new to you because your company probably already has started implementing these for, from your perspective. Um, but all of these have to be considered when you're trying to invest, uh, trying to apply holistic endpoint security. We spoke about governance, patch management, antivirus management, and then physical security. All right. Simple questions for you. What is the difference between on access scanning and on demand scanning? On access scanning and on demand scanning. On access is something which is pre scheduled from by your antivirus itself. Every day at 10 o'clock, you can experience an antivirus scan. On demand scanning is where you, as an end user, can request a scan of your laptop from your antivirus itself. Would you recommend installing multiple antivirus solutions on the same host? The answer is normally no, because two antivirus solutions, they don't go hand in hand. They will consider each other a threat and will hamper the functionality, the productivity of each other itself. It's always recommended that you select one vendor, maybe McAfee, maybe FireEye, maybe Symantec, whatever it is, Sophos, um, and you install this one and you just go ahead and work with this one particular vendor. Can OS patches be pushed to your laptop even when you're not in the company network? This applies more in the case of remote employees, guys who are working from home at length, especially yes. in this particular scenario. Absolutely, so thank you so much, Amit. So yes, the answer is yes. You can install operating system patches even when and people are remotely working. You don't necessarily have to be in the corporate network connected to your LAN or something like this for patches to be pushed. What are some challenges in 100% patch compliance? End users do not restart the desktops, lack of inventory management, Absence of a team, vendor is not pushing the patches. The most common three challenges. Absolutely, absolutely. So, 
the most common three patches, the reasons you will see is the first one, even the second and maybe the third as well. The fourth one is not usually a cause. Vendors are most, depends on which vendor, of course, but most vendors are um, very systematic. They are very uh, professional in terms of the way in which they define the patches and they roll them out on a periodic basis. Yes, this brings us to the next dimension, which is data loss prevention or DLP. Just to quickly um, look at where we are in the grand scheme of things, we have completed one, two, as well as almost all of three, where we looked at passwords and endpoints. We are jumping now to the third dimension of personal hygiene, which is data loss prevention. What is DLP? So guys, when you look at this one particular slide, the thing that you see is, Data exists in different states. Data can be addressed, data can be in motion, or data might be processed. Someone is looking at it, copy pasting it, um, or carrying out any activity on the data itself. Depend, irrespective of what state the data is existing in, your organization requires that data always stays within a trusted perimeter, what we call the trusted environment. The moment the data goes out of this trusted perimeter or trusted environment, you have what we call a data breach. All right. This is essentially the purpose of DLP to ensure that data is not breached, to ensure data does not get exfiltrated or go outside of this trusted perimeter, this trusted boundary that you have set. When I say <clears throat> when I say trusted perimeter or trusted environment, it can include your in internal network. It can also include external parties who connect to this network, like service providers. Uh, customers, vendors, partners, investors, and so on and so forth. So depending upon the principles of lease privileges, access control management, and so on that we saw earlier, the flow of data across this trusted universe has to be managed. This is the purpose of a DLP solution. Data can be leaked through multiple channels. Of course, you know this, we can uh, use USB sticks, we can Bluetooth the data outside of you know laptops, telephones, and so on. Um, we can also use um, file transfer protocols wherein we leak files to external third-party websites. Uh, the most common one being um, PDF to Word converters. A lot of platforms, a lot of online platforms which used to offer this PDF to Word conversion functionality. Um, I need to convert a PDF document to editable format. I don't really have the tool to do this. I just Google online PDF to Word converter. I upload the file, the PDF document, and I can download the Word readily. The downside to this approach is, of course, I might have leaked my company's confidential Word uh, PDF documents to some unknown third-party website, right? Or SMTP, wherein I'm just emailing the files to my personal email IDs, my praveen at gmail.com, for example. I'm just emailing my files to my external IDs. The last and least obvious one is printed documents. Very often, you walk through an organization the hotbed of you know uh, confidential information, salary slips, um, purchase orders, confidential IP um, documents. You you can find them around printers. Just walk near the printer, go near the shredder. You will definitely find some printed documents containing confidential information. All right, multiple channels through which data can be leaked. When you're implementing a DLP solution, you need to look at multiple dimensions, endpoints. Uh, and uh, at the endpoint level, the data level itself, network level, and lastly, of course, the physical level itself. Endpoint level talks about DLP tools installed on your laptops, which prevent USB um, uh, connectivity to your hard to, uh, to your to your laptop, which encrypts your hard disk. For example, we just spoke about this, and so on. Um, even for mobile devices, pins to ensure that you know. Um, Unauthorized people cannot unlock the phone if, for example, the phone is lost. Data level, you need to go in for encryption to ensure that even if the data is compromised, the data is not technically leaked because the pin to encrypt it is not compromised. In fact, guys, just a side note, uh, this reminds me of um, one of the points about GDPR. In GDPR, we talk about disclosure of data breaches. Um, one of the ex examples that you will see is uh, if your organization has experienced a breach, you are required to uh, notify data subjects, you're required to notify the data protection authorities, depending upon the risk level, right? Now, how do you know what the risk level is? A simple example GDPR tells you is, suppose you've experienced a data breach, uh, you've lost records pertaining to, uh, let's say, 5,000 of your customers. If the records were encrypted, the risk is low. So in this case, you might not have to notify these 5,000 customers that you've leaked the data. 
because it was encrypted and you're fairly confident about the strength of this encryption algorithm. Maybe it was AES-128 or AES-256-bit encryption, or you went in for a stronger, um, uh, you know, hashing or so on. As a result of which you're confident that the hackers still don't have access to the clear text personal data of your customers. In this case, you are exempted from notifying the individuals that their data has been leaked from a date from a GDPR perspective. All right. Quick question, guys. What is the difference between data loss and data leakage prevention? This is question number one. Question number two, you're minutes away from a client meeting. You're making final touches to a confidential document. You realize that your word to PDF converter has crashed. It doesn't work. So you just decide to use an online website. What are the implications of this activity? Let's take 60 seconds. Second option, I think uh, option number four, share a company confidential document with a third party website. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you, Amit. Thank you. All right. So the second question, based on Amit's answer and looking at any answers from here. We have some useful uh, information shared by Ali Moin. Muni from Ingram Micro Saudi Arabia. So he's talking about um, different. OK, this is uh, this is a piece of information which I hope is accessible to all of us talking about data loss vectors across different layers of data existence, different states of data existence, data at rest, data in motion and so on. I hope everybody has access to this. If not, let me know. I will email it to you. Thank you, Ali. Um, Ali has also explained the difference between loss as well as leakage. Loss is when data is not available anymore and leakage is when data has been compromised in terms of visibility. Absolutely correct, Ali. Thank you so much. You're right here. Um, data loss versus data leakage prevention. Data loss is when, where, when availability of data has been compromised. You don't even have the data with you anymore. It's just been lost. Data leakage is when confidentiality has been compromised, which means data has been disclosed. There's been a breach of the data to unauthorized entities. Even Manish has been uh, very active with the answers. Thank you so much, Manish. DLP is a mechanism, prevention mechanism to avoid data loss. Very good way of putting it, absolutely. In fact, the DLP tools, they they refer to data loss and data leakage um, interchangeably. They refer to both the concepts. So Manish is right in this approach of defining the answer. The intent is to ensure data is not compromised in terms of confidentiality as well as availability at the end of the day. All right, for the second question, uh, Mohsen Iqbal has given us the answer is number two. Initiated a DLP investigation and uh, Amit also informed us that the answer is. Um, I think you you said this one, right? I mean, shared, shared company confidential information with the third party website. Well, if you think about it, I think all of these are correct because uh, you must have probably shared your host name. You could have initiated an investigation. You lost your credibility and uh, you also shared company information with the third party website. All of these are possible implications for this answer. Of course, this is a uh, it's it's a rhetorical question. It's not something where you have a straightforward yes or no answer. So uh, depends on your organizational perspective, but all of these could be potentially correct answers. Excellent guys, so we're now jumping to the next section, which is social engineering. All right. Quick statement here by uh, this gentleman right here, Mr. Kevin Mitnick. Now, if you're not heard of Kevin Mitnick, I will recommend please Google him. Um, he goes by the title the world's most famous hacker. And in fact, uh, he was here in Dubai last year uh, to speak a keynote. In fact, keynote speaker at uh, at JSEC 2019 last year. And I, in fact, I was one of the guys who was lucky enough to um, meet him and you know click a selfie as well with him. Just one of the lucky fans. Guys, Kevin Mitnick was famous in the 90s um, and still, in fact, is one of the most popular hackers in the world, like he claims. Uh, he started out, as a, started out as a small time cyber criminal. Who, um, uh, in fact, he perfected the art of social engineering. He uh, was very good at tricking individuals, tricking typically the corporate, um, uh, you know, these telecom organizations. Um, he used deceit. He used charming mechanisms to fool people into believing that he was somebody else. 
and thereby revealing confidential information that he misused for launching attacks against organizations, making uh, long distance phone calls, impersonating individuals and so on. He was arrested uh, and uh, served his time. Well, uh, once he was done, he uh, turned over a new leaf and he became a cybersecurity advisor, cybersecurity consultant itself. Because he came from um, the criminal beginnings, he was very, very well versed with how a cyber criminal's mind works. This also led him to write very, very um, popular best-selling books, The Art of Deception and so on. You can Google his uh, books as well. Very, very interesting read when you have the time. So one of the things that Mr. Kevin Mitnick mentioned is company can spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on firewalls, ideas, IPS and so on. But if an attacker can call one trusted person and that person complies, all that money has gone waste. Guys, this is in line with the same message that I told you twice earlier today. The first one is when I introduced Ingram Micro to you and I told you we don't have a, 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 an, ex, an exclusive focus on technology. Rather, we focus on cyber security, which is built on people, processes and technologies, which is where we are developing advanced solutions to provide holistic approaches to cyber security. In fact, having an exclusive focus on technology is a misguided approach, and this is essentially what Mr. Kevin Mitnick is telling you here as well. You can have the best technical infrastructure, but if your people are not enabled, all of that is going to go to waste. I also mentioned this at a second point uh, today when I told you about the importance of people, processes, and technologies in cybersecurity. One of the earliest slides where we saw that many people typically will say cybersecurity, well, that's an IT issue. IT will take care of it. Cybersecurity is a business issue, guys. It's not an IT issue, and it's something that your C-level has to be enabled on, which is why we had a position of the CISO, this Chief Information Security Officer. This guy um, has been tasked with the, with the uh, responsibility of developing a security strategy, which is holistic, cutting across people, defining the processes, and then deciding what are the right technologies to invest in. All right. Social engineering is a mechanism where we, where, where a cyber criminal employs techniques of deception, techniques of deceit to fool people into revealing information that they normally wouldn't reveal. Information including um, confidential details, passwords, files, and so on. Um, information about the whereabouts of important individuals, like for example, CEOs or CISOs and so on, CFOs and so on. Information which can help them in carrying out larger cyber attacks against an organization and so on. Social engineering can take one of many forms. It can come to you um, as an email, which is what is phishing, the most common form of uh, social engineering. It can be an SMS, which is what we call smishing. It can be voice-based phishing, which is what we call wishing. And it can be tailgating or impersonation of individuals, which is physical social engineering itself. Phishing is, of course, something which all of us are very, very familiar with. In fact, I will challenge you to just open your Gmail inboxes and go through your spam folders, I'm sure you will see at least one or two phishing emails which have been very well filtered out by your Gmail spam filter. All right. SMS, sorry, smishing is where you get SMS based phishing uh, messages, the Nigerian Prince scams, which are very, very well popular. Typically, they used to come in as SMS messages. Uh, and of course, now you also get them as emails as well. Wishing is, of course, voice based phishing, a uh, voice based solicitation, wherein I call you. I pretend to be, for example, from your company's IT team or somebody else, and I ask you to reset my password. I ask you to reset your password, rather, or uh, give me, um, you know, some confidential details. Um, more common scam is where someone calls you and tells you that they found your ATM uh, card, your debit card, lying on the floor somewhere, and they just want to verify it as you. So they want your 16-digit card number, they want your CVV and X and so on and so forth. Only when you say it correctly will they, uh, you know, tell you where to come and collect it or something like this. Multiple scams, multiple formats that they take. Most people are gullible. Let's let's be honest. Let's face it. Most people are gullible, and uh, they do fall prey to these scams. Organizations have to take steps to ensure that employees do not fall victims to such scams. This is where training plays an important role, guys. All right. Um, typical way of, you know, typical traits of phishing mails. They normally have generic salutations like dear customer. They don't really address you by name. I'll, I will be honest, this is changing nowadays because a lot of phishing mails, they are very tailored, which is what we call spear phishing. They're highly tailored and uh, they do have your name, in fact, in them. They will 
have a message which is too good to be true. Like for example, click on this and perform this activity. You could probably earn 400K in five days. Or they will tell you things like your account has been compromised. You need to act now. Your shipment has arrived. Your parcel is here. Your order has been canceled. Something like this, which which will elicit action from you. And when I say action, it will include things like clicking on a link, downloading a file and so on. There will also be a terminology for you know urgency, which is like this one right here. If you do not respond in 24 hours, your account is likely to be deactivated. Something like this. And you will find obfuscated hyperlinks um, click here, uh, you know, open this link or so on and so forth, which has been hyperlinked. It's not exactly the link itself. So you will see that it is um, taking you to another page, not the page that you intend to be taken to. Also, the from ID would look very, very similar to a known sender, but it might not be the actual sender like you see over here, citibank1.co.uk. All right. Spear phishing is highly targeted phishing. Very, very well crafted, well uh, structured. A lot of effort goes into developing these uh, sphere phishing emails because you probably are a target that is worth being targeted, I would say. Highly customized, highly targeted content. Um, very contextual and very research backed. Typically, they have higher success rates. Uh, one of the interesting trends, guys, recently is that um, cyber criminals have started employing artificial intelligence, AI. Uh, AI based algorithms through which they are uh, launching, they are developing and launching spear phishing attacks at scale. I mean, there's no human intervention required. Um, you just develop the algorithm, then scan the profiles of individuals on social media uh, platforms, like for example, Twitter. You scrape their profiles, you learn a lot of information about them. Uh, what are the posts that they've made? What are the places they've visited? Who are the friends they have? What are the pages they like? And so on. And then based on this user's social media activity, you develop very, very personalized spear phishing emails and send them over to their inboxes on the same social media platforms. Or if you have their Gmail IDs or something, send it over to their inboxes there. Once you've done this, the chances of someone clicking these are very, very high because they are very, very research backed like you saw over here. And they are developed by these algorithms which have, it was proven by a study by Zero Fox in the UK that they are six times more efficient, more effective than uh, manually developed spear phishing emails. So we're looking at very, very uh, scalable, very efficient and accurate spear phishing attacks being launched by cyber criminals with the backing of AI, artificial intelligence. All right. Wishing is voice based phishing. Like I said, it's voice solicitation. Um, I don't have the go out onto YouTube and click on um, and type, um, you know, DEFCON wishing. DEFCON wishing. Just, just type this into your uh, YouTube. You'll see a simple video where this cybersecurity researcher, Ms. Uh, Jessica, she carries out a successful wishing attack against the the uh, the host of the program, which is this gentleman right here. This person right here. So just type DEFCON wishing onto YouTube when you get a chance and you can definitely see this video. If this was a real classroom session, I would have played this video for you. Uh, the audio doesn't play out well because it's an, uh, it's an online session. All right. So guys, simple question for you. Would you call this a phishing mail? Well, let's look at the red lights. Look at the from ID. Maybe this is an entity that you trust. We don't know yet. Your order has been canceled. Now, this is a subject which is designed to elicit action. You will definitely no, open this email. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. So, um, just the subject is something which has been designed to make you open the email. Dear user, your order number XYZ has been canceled. To claim a refund, please click here. This is what I was telling you is these obfuscated hyperlinks. You don't really know where this is going to take you. You also have an attachment which says, um, please read, read the attached file for the itemized contents of your order. All right. The chances of this being a phishing mail is very, very high. It really depends on whether you have a relationship with this company, safeco.com. Uh, if that relationship doesn't exist, steer away from this email. Definitely don't go near the attachment. And uh, when you say here, this particular link over here, you need to keep your mouse on top of it to see where it's taking you and you get this tooltip which tells you it's um, it's an advert.exe link, which is very, very scary. So under no circumstances are you to click these links. All right. This is one example of a phishing mail. 
There's another example right here. Customer care at hsbcc.ae, which is definitely a red flag. Confirmation of transaction on your card. Again, a subject which you will not ignore. You will have to open it. There is a typo over here. HSBC is always in uppercase. It is never in lowercase. And customer care at HSBC. Very likely to be a phishing mail when you look at these telltale signs. But guys, I'm going to be honest with you. Most of the phishing mails that, that you are seeing, that we've been seeing recently, they've been very, very well written, very tailored. And you don't see these obvious flags that, like you saw over here. Um, we have seen cases of business email compromise where someone is able to, uh, you know, uh, get inside the whole context of uh, business email conversations. So, for example, between the finance team of company A and the uh, purchasing team of company B. So this person is able to get inside these conversations and they're able to see what are the emails exchanged and just at the right time they they request the uh, the peer, the purchasing uh, the procurement team of company B to uh, you know send some uh, unauthorized financial transfers payments to a new bank account they say that you know our bank account they impersonate the finance team of company A essentially without the knowledge of course of company A and uh, redirect payments redirect financial transactions to a different bank account some of these have worked most of the time luckily they haven't worked uh, and uh, in the cases where they work the financial losses faced by companies have been huge um, this again is a case where we're looking at phishing being used by, by, by cyber criminals to um, um, to make illicit gains of course another area where we've seen phishing um, making financial gains for criminals is in the world of ransomware we'll talk about ransomware as well very very quickly just before that, we will jump into social media. Guys, uh, social media is always a gray area because um, it's there's nothing illegal when someone goes on Facebook or posts, uh, you know, how their day went and things like this. But when you look at it from a corporate perspective, organizations need to enable their employees to be a little more wiser in terms of what they are posting on social media websites. The way to do this is to have a social media policy which tells you what you can, what you cannot post on on these platforms. There have been cases, we'll see this in one of the questions, um, where employees assume that you know information that they develop belongs to them. And they go out and post it on, on posts on websites like LinkedIn, on YouTube, explaining how they developed, for example, an algorithm, how they wrote a piece of code which uh, automated a particular activity and so on. Unfortunately for them, this belongs to the company, it's not their own IP. How do they draw this line between what is their creative uh, work versus what is uh, what what is the IP of the company? That needs to be very very clearly explained to the employees. Be careful what you post. Refer to your company's policy. Don't discuss your company on social media websites like Glassdoor, uh, Facebook groups, so on and so forth. Don't post company internal information on LinkedIn, on job portals, for instance, names of clients, so on and so forth. You've seen this very often. Um, people tend to be over enthusiastic about describing their achievements on their resumes, on their LinkedIn uh, profiles. So they will go to the extent of describing what project they did for what client. And they explain this in detail on their CVs or even on their LinkedIn posts, LinkedIn profiles. Typically, this level of detail is not to be included. Uh, from a from a security perspective, clients can be anonymized. You can just say, "I did this project for a leading bank." That's more than enough. Instead of saying, "The bank was ABC, and this is a project that I did for them," right? So employees have to be educated on them on these di dimensions. Photos taken in restricted work areas, especially uh, from the perspective of banks or uh, you know critical development centers, data centers, and so on. Employees they may be allowed to take their phones inside, but taking selfies and posting these selfies on Facebook. Sometimes they can have monitor screens in the background, uh, client logos in the background, so on and so forth, which gets published onto social media platforms. And, and this is never, never um, uh, something which goes down well because you're, you're actually doing DLP in this particular case. All right. Secure your account, your social media profiles, set up, uh, you know, two-factor authentication. Watch out for the apps that you are enabling on your platforms, on your social media um, profiles. We spoke about the Cambridge Analytica scandal where there was this personality test launched by um, this, de this developer called uh, Alexander Coogan. And um, this particular app 
requested permission to multiple aspects of users' Facebook profiles, including their friends list, photos, and so on and so forth, and it misused this information. Who is to blame? Even the users are to blame, if you ask me. It's not just Facebook that is uh, to be entirely culpable. Even users are to blame because uh, you need to think about what permissions you're giving to these uh, you know, apps and what is the benefit, the risk versus rewards benefit that you're getting from giving these permissions to the app. SMS email alerts for any suspicious activity so that you are notified in time uh, if there is any suspicious activities like passwords being changed on your on your uh, Instagram, for example. Review the privacy settings, guys. This is a very, very controversial subject, in fact, because companies like Facebook have been heavily, heavily criticized for making their privacy settings, their privacy policies very, very dynamic, changed as per their requirements and very, very complicated to navigate. So they've done their best, I think, to um, they've improved a lot within the last couple of years, especially since the advent of GDPR, um, wherein they made it easier for people to realize, to recognize and assimilate the privacy settings, the privacy rights of these individuals. Just for those who joined in late at the beginning of the session, we defined privacy as uh, how much control do individuals have over their own personal data when they're giving it up to, uh, you know, con companies, corporations and so on. So how much control do we have as individuals over our own personal data? That is what privacy is all about. Well, I, I, I've got to give it to them. Uh, companies like Facebook, Google and so on, they made it easier for us to exercise this control. But nevertheless, it doesn't change the fact that privacy settings are still very, very complex, and difficult to navigate. Um, we as users have to be more active, more proactive in terms of reviewing, deleting unnecessary contacts, um, making sure we are restricting access to our, our settings. For example, posts by default will be available only to friends, not to the whole world, and so on and so forth. All right. A uh, little bit about information that Facebook knows about each and every one of us. This, these screenshots are taken quite some time back, but still valid. Uh, relationship status, employer, job title, education. What group do you fit under? Frequent travelers, mobile devices, birthday on March 3rd, so on and so forth. So this is just a just a tip of the iceberg, guys. You know this. Facebook knows knows you better than you know yourself and google is also um the uh, the bigger corporation from this perspective so we have to be aware of this we as employees have to be more careful in terms of what we're posting and how uh, we are letting these corporations use our data all right simple question here software service <clears throat> provider has published content that she developed for her client she posted it on linkedin when this was reported by the client she justified her stand saying that the content was developed by her and therefore belong to her. Do you think this is a correct approach? It's 30 seconds for you guys. So not at all. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes, you're right. Um, any other answers? Absolutely not. All right, perfect. All the answers are correct. Thank you so much, guys. Um, the reason we can justify our answer is when we join a company, we would sign um, a, an employment agreement. We might sign the um, uh, non-disclosure agreement or any other agreement as part of the onboarding process, which will definitely have a claim, a clause which states any piece of information that we develop as part of this engagement uh, would belong to the company. It's the intellectual property of the company itself. So especially in this particular case, the content that she developed, she developed it for her client, which is her company's client essentially. And she went and posted it on LinkedIn. Now this is a real case by the way, guys, which I had actually encountered. It's not, in fact, most of the questions that you see here are based on real life scenarios including the 1.3 terabyte uh, case that we spoke about. That was exactly the amount of data that was uh, that was lost in one of the incidents that I worked with. So these are real life scenarios. These are not um, uh, pieces of imagination or products of imagination, rather they actually happened. So the legal team was called in for this particular case and uh, of course the HR and incident response teams. And we had to inform this lady that uh, she had already signed an NDA when she started working for this client. And, and on this NDA, it was mentioned that any piece of work that she develops for this 
uh, for this engagement was the IP of the company. It was not her own IP. So it's just that she conveniently forgot about this. And and I wouldn't blame her. Most employees, they, we don't even see what we're signing when we join. And then a couple of years down the line, we could totally forget what we signed. So this sort of security mindset is something that has to be inculcated across organizations as well as their teams. All right. Disgruntled employees, they post anonymous criticisms on social media sites. Um, for example, these uh, you know confession groups that you see on Facebook and so on, or Glassdoor, where we can review your companies. What controls can organizations take to address this sort of behavior? Um, like I said, posting on social media platforms, it's not illegal. Um, of course, it depends on which country you're from, but absolutely 95% of the cases, it's not illegal to post um, uh, things on social media. Um, from a corporate perspective, how can we govern this by having a social media policy, which which defines or gives guidelines in terms of what is acceptable, what is not acceptable content to be posted on social media websites. All right. Next up is ransomware guys. And um, these are two major cyber attacks that we had encountered in 2017. First one was WannaCry, the second one was Petya. What really is the business model of ransomware? Simple, very, very simple. It's called cash for keys. I will encrypt your data, and if you want to get your data back, you need to pay me some money. This is a simple business model, but it gained a lot of traction, particularly in 2017 and even 2018. Died down a little bit last year, but still we are seeing a lot of um, uh, you know activity in the region specifically. Um, files are encrypted and cannot be decrypted in 95%, 99% of the cases even, I would say, um, because the encryption levels are pretty, pretty, are, are pretty strong, very, very good, in fact. Um, and the only way of getting your data back is to pay the attacker and you would um, you know, be given the keys to decrypt your data. This is a whole methodology. And what you see here are the screens that um, were presented to the victims of WannaCry in 2017, as well as again, uh, just one or two months later, there was Petya, the Petya attack, which was more, more strict than, or more extreme than I would say WannaCry, but not as uh, far reaching. WannaCry affected, 230,000 computers in 150 countries around the globe. So this is one of the areas where uh, Bitcoin was used because payments were accepted in Bitcoins. Um, and this is the um, address that you could take for the Bitcoin uh, for, for the Bitcoin address to which you had to send the money. All right. So guys, uh, what if you are hit by ransomware? I'll just come back to this. What if you are hit by ransomware? Um, do you need to pay this particular individual, this particular attacker? Our recommendation is don't interact with them, don't pay anything to them unless you have contacted your legal team and you have engaged a cybersecurity company. All right, because the way in which you would negotiate with these attackers, um, it most likely it will be over email. Um, do not do not initiate any sort of response or communication with them unless you have consulted with a cybersecurity organization as well as included your legal team as well. Um, even in terms of negotiation, we've seen cases where attackers have initially demanded, uh, you know, so to something to the tune of, let's say, five thousand dollars for a small company, but they're able to bring it down to even five hundred dollars, just because they want to make some quick, quick cash. We've seen cases like this. We've also seen cases where attackers uh, demand to the tunes of millions of dollars, and are not at all willing to budge. So we've seen both kinds of cases. Of course, depends on the type of company that is targeted. The attackers have done their research. Uh, as well as the amount of data that they have encrypted, right? Some companies have been lucky enough to have backup, at least partial backup, and uh, therefore they don't really care about the ransomware. They just um, restore the data and, uh, you know, install some anti-ransomware tools to ensure they are no longer attacked. Um, but most companies we've seen in the region, especially, they have not invested in appropriate backup mechanisms. And uh, as a last resort mechanism, they are looking at whether they should pay the attackers. Our recommendation is there's no point in paying attackers, guys, because uh, the guarantee is very, very less. Think of it this way. If you are a cyber criminal and you have launched a ransomware attack against 10 companies, right? Out of these 10, the likelihood that someone will pay is only one, one out of 10. So one guy pays you. Now, your target was to make, let's say, uh, $1 million out of 10 people. Now, you have to make that $1 million out of this one individual itself. So what you will do is you will give him a little bit of his data after he's paid, but then you will say, I, ne I need more money. And the demand is just going to be endless, right? So it is never a wise advice, a wise um, approach to pay the attackers because from a criminal's mindset, 
they need to achieve their targets, financial targets, and uh, they will try to get everything from one victim who is actually willing to pay rather than from all the victims themselves who are who don't really care. So um, don't pay. Engage your legal team. Engage a cybersecurity company. Is it possible to decrypt data that has been compromised, that has been encrypted by a hacker? Uh, most of the cases, it is not possible, guys. I'll be honest with you. It's not been. It's not possible because the encryption mechanisms that they deploy are very, very strong. Um, so unless you have the keys, you can't really get the data back. If you didn't have backup already, <clears throat> um, unfortunately, um, if you've been hit by ransomware, it is very. It's next to impossible to get your data back. So either you pay the ransom again, which is not advisable, or you forget about the data and try to re reconstruct the data from whatever else is available. So what you can infer from this is the best way to protect yourself from ransomware is to be take a preventive approach rather than a responsible approach. Similar to COVID-19, I would say, right? So have backups at all points of time because we don't have a mechanism to protect yourself, solid uh, a solid mechanism to protect yourself against a ransomware attack. Ransomware could come to you through Email, I told you phishing is one of the largest carriers, the primary carriers of ransomware, uh, ransomware kits to the victims. Or it could, be, it could be through a website itself where an employee visits a particular website and he clicks on a link in this website or so on and the, the, the payload is able to execute on his, on his system and then spreads across the network itself. All right. So different ways through which ransomware can, can enter your network. Potential impacts could be that your confidential files are stolen or leaked. Um, file servers are therefore not available. They're exposed to secondary or tertiary damage, including encryption of hard disk, MBR, and so on. All right. So guys, um, quick questions for us on terms of ransomware. What is your best bet against ransomware? My files are already encrypted. Can I still be affected? My files are already read only. Can I still be affected? Some some insightful questions, I hope. Uh, let's take a minute to answer them. Well, first option uh, is the in, in, encryption. Second for no. And third for yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Thank you. We'll just take a couple more seconds. All right, guys. All right, we have a couple more answers. <clears throat> All right. What are some possible ways to get hit by ransomware? Kumail, uh, thank you for this question, sir. So the most common mechanism is through an email phishing mail which came to you. Another possibility is that um, employees have visited some, you know, um, unauthorized websites, for example, and from here they've clicked some links, downloaded some files, which turned out to contain uh, ransomware or any other sort of malware. Uh, OK, now in terms of answers, data backup is the first answer. Absolutely correct, sir. Uh, the first, the best bet against ransomware is data backups, because if you, like I said, it's a preventive approach that you need to take, not a recovery approach. So if you already have a backup, you're, you're best protected against ransomware. Second question, my files are already encrypted. Can I still be affected by ransomware? The answer is yes, you can still be um, affected because the ransomware will encrypt your encrypted files. One more layer of, en layer of encryption is applied. The only benefit is that attackers cannot see your files because you have encrypted them by yourself. Third question is, any answers for the third one? No. My files are already read only. Can I still be affected by ransomware? Um, the answer is yes as long as the ransomware has the ability to escalate its privileges and modify those read write permissions if not it might not be possible for the uh, for the malware to actually make any changes on your read only files so um, the answer is yes as long as there are specific conditions available if not you're protected you're protected against ransomware okay so this was it about uh, ransomware 
let's see where we are in the grand scheme of things. All right, so we have completed. We've completed from sections one all the way to sections four. We define cybersecurity. We define the world of cybersecurity, the dark web, and so on. We looked at access control management, risk management, basics of cybersecurity, personal hygiene, and then we looked at some common attacks, which was social engineering, social media security, as well as ransomware. <clears throat> We're going to jump straight forward into the world of physical security and incident management in a minute. All right. What is physical security? Simple rhetorical question, guys. We've got a state of the art security operations center where we've got the best SIM solutions. We've got the best trained team. Well, how many cameras have you got in your security operations center? How well defined are the physical entry controls to your security operations center? Physical security is sometimes an overlooked paradigm of cyber security or information security because we have an excessive focus on technology when it comes to cyber security. Physical security is important and it consists of three broad categories of controls, namely preventive, detective, as well as administrative controls, right? So what are these preventive controls? Preventive controls are, for example, access control mechanisms, which talk about those same three A's which, which we considered earlier authentication, authorization, as well as accountability. Access control mechanisms like your access cards, biometric readers, security guards, and so on and so forth. Mechanisms to ensure that physical access is controlled. You have preventive mechanisms to go on and restrict physical access to your information assets. Detective controls, they will detect any physical activity or criminal activity, which is ongoing in a protected area. All right. Most common example, of course, is CCTV cameras. Nowadays, we have video analytics built into CCTV cameras, smart cameras, which not only do they monitor, um, you know, what's going on in an environment, they can also analyze and identify patterns of physical movement inside these environments. So for instance, you see people running, you see people fighting or any sort of, you know, a behavior that indicates signs of duress. People are under uh, duress or under stress. The cameras can actually detect, actually detect it. And um, of course, this is AI based and they can notify the um, the uh, security guards who are actually in the uh, in the building management system room, sitting and monitoring the premises. Most common in malls or any other uh, areas where a lot of public access is prevalent. All right. Uh, so CCTV cameras is one example. The other examples are burglar alarms, motion detectors, pressure sensors, heat sensors, and so on. All right. Administrative controls, you have preventive, you have detective. What about administrative controls? You've got the best CCTV cameras and the access control mechanisms in place. You need to have governance around it, which means policies, procedures, roles, responsibilities, as well as overall strategy and communication across the entire organization. Facility specific risk assessments. We spoke of risk assessments at length, guys. So the focus on physical security would be what has to be covered from facility specific risk assessments. Awareness is also important, which means trainings for employees to ensure they do not do anything to circumvent access control mechanisms. Um, as well as tests, fire drills and emergency evacuation procedures to see how well the uh, controls are actually functioning in practice. Right. So simple question for yourselves conduct a facility specific risk assessment of the following building let's take a minute to analyze this floor plan you can type in your chat your, your feedback uh, in the chat window you can even speak them out if the chat feature is disabled for you let us know what you think are the risks from a physical security perspective for this area for this building
Uh, I guess the reader center is uh, nearby to the reception. That's the front gate. I guess it should be somewhere in the middle or somewhere. Maybe. Amazing, amazing. Very good point. So very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kumail. Any other answers? Let me just check. Window in the data center. Yes, that is a very true point. Very good, valid point. Door of the data center does not have the cam camera to monitor. Very true. No CCTV in the passage. No CCTV in work areas one and two. All right. Data center is beside the reception, which is, I think, uh, not valid question. Absolutely, absolutely, sir. Same point as uh, Mr. Kumail mentioned earlier. Thank you so much, guys. Very, very valid points. Ideally, critical centers like your data centers should be positioned here in the middle of the building, um, uh, you know, so that the risk of someone physically uh, launching um, some sort of physical attacks, intrusions, even grenades from a, from a military perspective. Uh, you reduce the impact when such an attack happens by positioning the sensitive parts of the buildings within within the heart or the most internal areas of the building. This is one risk that you see. Another risk is about CCTV cameras not being present in work areas one and two. Absolutely valid points. Um, this is why cyber security or physical security is usually a gray area because uh, you never know how many cameras are enough. Are enough? How high? When I say you have a six foot perimeter fence over here, is six feet enough? Or do you need to go up to eight feet? Do you need to invest in, um, uh, you know, broken glass, which is embedded in the top of the fence? All of these are the questions that you need to address. All right, just give me a second, guys. As many of us brightly mentioned, data centers not being positioned in the right place. But the other most important point is data centers being accessible to common areas like this passageway that you see over here. Typically, when you you might have seen this in your offices as well, when you access a data center, you'll have to go through a long not really able to common areas like a like a, you know an open uh, area where people are likely to gather, people are likely to convene either formally or informally. So you don't have easy access to sensitive areas like data centers. But the most important point which nobody has seen is that the security desk is kept inside the building. So what about the front gate? Before someone accesses the, the front gate itself, you should have a security desk who is filtering the traffic, the people, you know, whatever it is right at the front gate itself and only then granting them access to the building. There is no security desk at the front gate like you can see over here. This is also an important point which uh, which you will see when you when you dig deeper. Um, six foot perimeter fence. This is just a, a distractor. It's not. It doesn't really mean anything for this particular case. Maybe six feet is enough. Maybe it's not. We really don't know. Depends on the case. Um, but that's why I'd like you to see physical security is something which is always in a never ending discussion. Um, there never is enough when it comes to cyber security. When it comes to physical security controls for an organization. Right. Next up is incident response, guys. Simple question, have you ever been breached? What happens when you have been breached, when you've been breached? The moment that an organization detects that they've been breached, the steps that they need to take in order to respond, in order to contain, in order to mitigate the incident is what we call incident response or incident management workflow. I'm skipping the statistics because um, we don't have the time to go to them right now. I will come straight to the core of incident response mechanism. Steps that you need to take are what we call triage, investigation, containment, and then recovery or prevention. What do I mean by triage? 
this is a terminology that is borrowed from the medical practitioners from the medical practice itself if someone has been involved in an accident and they walk into a clinic the they will be redirected to the nurses station where their you know the temperature of their vitals are checked initially any uh, signs of any broken uh, bones any signs of any bleeding or internal injuries and so on after that they will be referred for the more specialized treatment and more specialized diagnosis with the with the uh, doctors right the specialists this level of l1 analysis where you try to classify you try to identify what is the extent of damage that was uh, you know born or undergone by the by the um, patient is what we call triage similarly in the cyber security world when you identify that there's been a breach there's been some sort of incident you try to perform l1 analysis on this incident which is wherein you try to identify what had happened what is the extent of damage what is the criticality or priority level of this particular incident get as much information as possible and then you assign a, a, the appropriate investigator if it was a network based incident like a cyber attack you need your cyber security team you might need your digital forensics team if it was a physical security incident you need your physical security team if it was hr related like there was someone has been bullying people or so on uh, you need the hr as well to be involved so you cat you categorize you characterize you prioritize that incident and then you assign the uh, corresponding investigators the next step is investigation wherein you have a systematic mechanism to be followed for identifying what is the root cause of this incident all right once you've identified the root cause you can effectively contain the incident you can minimize the spreading of this incident of course um, this step should be carried out even before the identification of the root cause itself wherein you carry out quarantining and evidence collection and so on once you identify the root cause you can also effectively contain the incident by eliminating that root cause if there was a human being an employee that was involved maybe you want to develop some penalties for this employee to ensure that the incident is not recurring or something like this lastly how do you resume operations and ensure that your organization's um, business objectives still continue to be achieved despite this particular incident and how do you ensure the incident does not recur all right throughout this entire process communication with all stakeholders internal external as well as um you know regulatory bodies customers corporate communications all of this has to happen through a structured mechanism in the organization as well as across the organization all right which of the following are the main res reason incident response fails senior management awareness no procedures communication does not work there is no channel for the employees to report incidents all of these are important reasons which is the main reason i would say lack of senior management support because without their support everything is going to fail so the most it, security always succeeds when it is taken through a top down approach wherein it starts with senior management support awareness and commitment and then boils down the layers to the different parts of the organization itself all right so guys this brings us to the last section for today which is the challenges that you will face before we start the last session i would like to thank you once again for staying with us throughout the training um it really we really hope that the training was valuable to you and uh, you know that you were able to learn something and you were also inspired to take action in towards your cyber security strategy or plans for your organization or your career itself if you want to specialize in cyber security going forward thank you so much for this we'll quickly jump into the final section and then we will wrap up for today typical challenges that you will face in promoting cyber security internal to your organization first one is a false sense of security you will typically see your management organizations management telling you guys we've never been hacked so we don't expect to be hacked this year as well this is a misguided approach misguided confidence in terms of an organization's immunity against cyber attack and this is human nature there's no point blaming uh, uh, you know individuals or management and so on this is a false notion of course it's only a matter of time before organizations get breached when you look at the data statistically speaking it's only a matter of time before every company has experienced at least one cyber attack as part of their operational lifetimes so um it's important to ensure that 
you are educating your management about this, the statistical uh, details. You have done risk assessments internally to identify what are the uh, uh, just a second to identify what are the risks and make informed decision making pertaining to cybersecurity investments. So if it hasn't happened to us, we have to make sure it doesn't happen to us even this year as well as the years coming forward. We also tend to underestimate target value by saying, you know what, I'm a small company. I only have 50 employees, 100 employees. Cyber criminals, they normally go after the big companies, the huge mega corporations of the world, the Sonys and the HBOs and the Marriott's of the world. It's not really small corporations like us. Statistics speak otherwise. 50% of small and mid-sized companies reported suffering at least one cyber attack. Simple statistic from Keeper Security. Um, in fact, I've seen this trend uh, playing out even a lot more here in the UAE, where we have seen small companies which don't even have a website. They've been targeted by these opportunistic attackers. We saw these kinds of attackers earlier today. Opportunistic attacks where they're just looking to make $500 or $1,000, but the impact to the business and the reputation of the business to its customers, no matter how small this customer base is. This is under irreparable, you know, the, the damage once done, it's very, very um, uh, disturbing. And the profile of the organization as a value added, as a value, uh, you know, based solution spurt or whatever it is, it gets really hit once even one attack has been experienced by the company. So never underestimate your value as an organization to cyber criminals. The most important one is how do you quantify return on security investment? This is where a little bit of math would be involved, guys. Um, one of the biggest areas, biggest challenges that you would face is your senior management, your CFOs, your CIOs, they don't speak security, they speak dollars, they speak top line and bottom line. Simple questions that you can encounter as a security manager is, you know what, Praveen, we spent $50,000 last year on a firewall, but we haven't seen any incidents. We don't understand what is the return on investment on this $50,000. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut your budget by 50% for next year, because we don't think you need $50K dollars or so on. So these are the kinds of messages that you would hear. How you can address this challenge is by coming out with a simple formula to calculate the return on your security investment. This is a formula that you see over here. Return on security investment is equal to loss expectancy without security investment minus loss expectancy with security investment. Without minus with. Subtract that from the investment and divide it by the investment. This is your return on security investment. Simple formula. Let's break it down with an example. It is estimated that ransomware will cost your company $300,000 every year. All right. Again, this is an estimation. It's not actual, uh, you know, data based on hard facts. It's estimated data. CapEx on anti-ransomware solution is USD $100,000. What is the return on security investment? Given that you expect three ransomware attacks a year and the anti-ransomware solution has a success rate of 80%. All right, now let's break this down, guys. So your organization is expecting three ransomware attacks a year and you expect that every ransomware will cost $300,000. So in a given year, you can lose $900,000 to ransomware as your estimation. This is your loss without any sort of investment, any sort of cybersecurity solutions. You're going to lose $900,000. Now what you're going to do is you're going to buy a ransomware solution, anti-ransomware solution, which costs $100,000 to buy. And it has a success rate of 80%. So with 80% success rate, your annualized, you can lose, let's say, the same $900,000 only 20% of the time, which means 900 into 100 minus 80, which is 20% is your annualized loss expectancy with this particular investment in an anti ransomware tool. All right, to break it down again, to repeat, annualized loss expectancy without security investment is 900K. When you invest in a security tool, you have a success rate of 80%. So 20% of 900K, which is 180K is your loss. Now your return on investment is 900 minus 180 minus 100 by 100K. All right, this is the same formula that we saw over here. Annualized loss expectancy without minus annualized loss expectancy with minus investment by investment. The investment here is $100,000. You've just calculated annualized loss expectancy without is 900K, whereas with investment, it is 180K. Subtract that 
from each other and then minus 100k by 100k you have a return on investment of 620 percent if this doesn't convince your senior management i don't know what will all right so guys i know this formula it's a little complicated and it's not easy to ensure that everybody has understood this given that this is an online session and we can't really interact so well if you still have doubts to understand this please get in touch with me through email i will be sharing my email id as well uh, shortly with you after this session or just type into the chat window um, and we can be in touch as well um this formula will help you to quantify what is your return on security investment to repeat it again ALE minus ALE dash minus investment by investment. The loss expectancy without any sort of investment is 900K, whereas with an investment, it is 180K. Subtract the two, it is 720K minus 100,000 divided by 100,000. 100,000 is a capital investment, CapEx on a cybersecurity solution, which is anti ransomware tools. This will give you the value of 6.2, which is nothing but 620%. Any questions at this point, please let me know. All right. No questions as yet on this particular point. Regarding the material, I'm sorry, Ahmed, I wouldn't be able to share the slides with you. The recording is something that we'll be able to share, definitely, yes, but not the slides. All right. So um, this is a simple example where you can overcome this challenge of not being able to quantify your return on security investment. Use the formula. Another challenge that you will face is people confuse compliance with security. They say, guys, we already are certified against PCI. We are certified against ISO 27001. We are virtually unhackable. Well, this is business language. This is your business leaders speaking to you. From a security perspective, we know that this is not true. Security is always greater than compliance, and the difference between the two lies in risk. We already spoke about this. How much security is enough security? Risk is how you can address this by carrying out a formal risk assessment. So I'm compliant with PCI DSS does not mean that I'm that I'm unbreakable, I'm unbreachable or something like this. I need to carry out a risk assessment to find out what are the risks that are still existing in my organization and how do I make sure that they are truly addressed. There is no such thing as 100% security, guys, because to be 100% secure, you need to have a budget of infinite dollars. Both of these are hypothetical concepts, not possible. Last one is, of course, the lack of expertise, the lack of teams. I spoke about this earlier, guys. The demand for cybersecurity professionals, it has only been booming since the last 10 years. Uh, we still struggle. Organizations are still struggling to get the right qualified sort of expertise because people, if they don't have the skills, they don't have the certifications. Uh, sorry, if they have the skills, they don't have the certifications. If they have the certifications, they don't have the communications expertise, which is required to, uh, you know, convey the requirements to your senior management. So a lot of skill sets go into building a, a holistic, uh, you know, cybersecurity profile, and um, it's still difficult to find the right candidates. There's a lot of master's degree programs nowadays. A lot of universities offer master's degrees, even PhD degrees um, in cybersecurity. It's worthwhile considering pursuing these. For those of us who don't have the luxury of getting, you know, uh, another master's degree or, or you know, de devoting time and money to a master's degree, it's worth investing in cybersecurity certifications. You have the very famous CISSPs and CIPPs and CIPMs and so on from a privacy standpoint. If you're into ethical hacking, OSCP is a golden standard to pursue. CEH version 10 is also uh, is also very very widely accepted, but OSCP really is hands on. It gets it really breaks you down. Uh, as as a person, I would say, I mean, speaking to a lot of OSCP aspirants as well as OSCP can um, successfully certified professionals. So, um, so yeah, certification is a good way to go. The other thing is undergoing a lot of online trainings like the ones that you just attended today. Thank you so much for this. If you're looking to specialize in cybersecurity uh, as a career, you need to get certified. You need to get yourself trained. Um, a lot of online trainings are available today, especially after COVID-19. A lot of organizations have um, opened up their courses for free. So consider pursuing them as well. Definitely worthwhile. If you're looking to enable your organization's security strategy as a, as a team, it's definitely worth speaking to cybersecurity solutions providers. We from Ingram Micro definitely offer this as part of our portfolio. Get in touch with us and we can help you to enable your team, build the right skill set for your team, as well as build your security strategy from a consultancy um, uh, you know, services standpoint. 
Simple question, guys. Which of the most following, which of the fa following factors contributes to uncertainty and computing return on security investment? Let's take 30 seconds. This is the last question, by the way, for today. I think it's the last slide as well. All of the above. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Manish. All of the above. Uh, thank you, Saad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saad. Thank you, Amit. Yes. All of the above. In fact, number of occurrences of an incident cannot be predicted. Absolutely. Cost of a single incident also cannot be predicted. Absolutely. CapEx is readily available, but, but OPEX is not readily available. Very true. When estimating the cost, non-quantifiable factors such as loss of reputation, loss of productive time, all of this is not considered. So yes, the answer is all of the above. Thank you so much. So guys, this brings us to the close of the training itself. Again, on behalf of Ingram Micro Cybersecurity, please accept my thanks for being with us throughout this training. We really hope that you were able to derive value from it and that you were inspired to option A, uh, pursue a career in cybersecurity if, not, if you're already not specialized in this. Um, option B is to build a cybersecurity strategy as well as or enhance the cybersecurity strategy for your organization. We from Ingram Micro, we are committed to helping you no matter which option you have selected, option A, B or whatever it is. Be in touch with us. Our email ID just for, for your reference is cyber.meta at ingrammicro.com. The recording for this particular session it will be made available on social media platforms as well as will be pumped into your inboxes. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and um, we look forward to being in touch with you. Again, I wish you all the, sa the safety to yourselves as well as your family in the face of COVID-19. I hope that we get over this, uh, this pandemic very soon and um, let's be in touch in the meantime. Thank you so much. Have an excellent rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Hello, I just would like to ask, um, how can we receive the, um, the recording? Uh, thank you, Ahmed. So the recording, we will be uh, circulating it on social media and we will also um, put it on your uh, inboxes as well. We will send you the, uh, the email as well. Um, we'll make sure it comes to you. Don't worry about it. Thank you. So uh, already you have our emails, but uh, if you want just to confirm, I can send you the mail via chat window. Sure, sure, sure. I have your email. I have the emails of everybody uh, who is registered. I will send it over to you. Thank you. Perfect. OK, thanks. But thanks thank very you. much. And thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, earlier you told uh, about the certificate uh, like uh, to submit the uh, engineering council. So can you send it? Yes, yes. Sir. Just uh, send send me an email, please, on this uh, cyber.meta and uh, I will uh, you know give you the CP certificate for this. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of your day.